later. Hopefully it will be recorded on YouTube as well, but if not, it will definitely be on our Facebook page. Um, thank you for those of you that have been uh, patiently waiting whilst I try and work out the logistics and uh, get over my uh, lack of computer knowledge and technical skills. Um, the purpose of this is to prepare you as much as possible for your exam that is on Monday and to ensure that you go into that exam feeling as confident as possible. So it's very much led by you guys in the sense that you can let me know if there are particular topics that you would like me to cover. I had a couple of questions in advance that I will cover today. But if there are particular topics that are giving you sort of more stress, uh, if there are particular questions that you would like me to go through in terms of a rough layout and how I would construct answers for it, then uh, feel free to shoot those over on Facebook. Uh, I am at the moment not looking at our YouTube channel yet because as far as I can see, it's still not live on, on uh, YouTube. But on the Facebook page, I have it in front of me on my left. And so any questions that you guys have, I hopefully will be able to answer them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so, yes, okay, I've got a couple of questions already. Uh, let me just quickly message everyone on the YouTube channel to let them know to switch over to Facebook because I think it shows us that 19 people are waiting to get access. Uh, so. Oops. Okay, sorry, I <clears throat> just want to make sure those people that are on YouTube know to switch over to, um, to Facebook. So let's get started, let's do this. So the starting point is I had a question about monopsony and what a monopsony is, how they can ask questions about a monopsony. And I wanna go through the first phase, which is to understand what a monopsony actually is. So a monopsony is where there is a powerful buyer. Um, and there are two good examples of that. In the UK, the NHS is an example of a monopsony in the sense that they essentially buy the services of doctors, nurses, and therefore, if they turned around and decided to reduce the wages that they pay nurses, well, there isn't much that they can do about it because the vast majority of jobs that are available are through the NHS. So in that sense, the NHS are therefore the monopsonist in that transaction, right? A second example of a monopsony are the supermarkets in the UK. There are only a small handful of supermarkets in the UK. And so if Tesco turn around to a farmer and say, look, we want a lower, lower price for this produce, well, you don't really have much bargaining power as the, the farmer and you have to therefore accept that lower price and you have to accept that Tesco have the power in that relationship, okay? So, two types of questions that they are likely to ask about a monopsony based on past paper trends. The first is a question that was asked in June 2012, Unit 3, so the old spec, where they had an extract about the supermarkets and a particular company called Northern Foods and it said, assess the degree of monopsony power in the supermarket industry. So very broadly, there are certain things that I would want you to be looking out for to determine whether monopsony power is either high or low in a certain industry. So the factors that would suggest that monopsony power is high, number one, is if there's only a handful of big, set of big buyers. So you look at the concentration ratio, and if you see that there are only a handful of big supermarkets, well, that suggests monopsony power is high because you have no real choice as a farmer but to sell to one of these big supermarkets. So that's number one. The second thing that I'd be looking out for is if there is evidence of the profits of suppliers falling, that would indicate that monopsony power again is high. Why? Because it means that they're pushing down the prices that they're being charged for the produce as in the supermarkets are. And so as a result, the suppliers are losing out and their profits are falling. You might even see evidence of some of the suppliers leaving the market. They might even be shutting down. So that's two. Number three, another thing that I could look out for that will determine and suggest that monopsony power is high is that actually monopsony power can be good for the consumer because the effect of monopsony power is that it would cause variable costs for the supermarket, the monopsonist, to go down. But as a result of that, they can pass on some of the benefits to the consumer in the form of a lower price. You can even depict this diagrammatically by drawing a cost and revenue diagram 
and shifting MC and AC down. I will do that later, but just for the sake of getting through this fairly quickly, um, that's another factor that you'd look out for. If the prices that consumers are paying for the produce, for the goods, are going down, that would suggest that monopsony power, again, is high. Another thing that would suggest monopsony power is high is if there are many, many sellers. If there are loads and loads and loads of small sellers, well, it's very easy for me to turn around to go one farm and go, look, if you don't sell it to me at this price, I'm just going to go next door to the other farm. And therefore, I have more power as Tesco. If I'm the supermarket, I can basically kind of pit you guys against one another if there are loads and loads of you supplying this good. Yeah? So that's another factor that would suggest that monopsony power is high. The last one I think that you'd look out for possibly is the fact that if the goods being supplied, the goods being sold to the supermarkets are fairly homogenous or they're pretty similar. So if you're just selling potatoes, well, you don't have much bargaining power because I can turn around and buy the potatoes from pretty much anywhere. So if I turn around and say to you, I want a lower price for the potatoes, you kind of have to accept it as the farmer. Therefore, I, as Tesco, will have more monopsony power in that transaction. Is that clear? So that's the first half, which is suggesting monopsony power. Yeah, that's high. The other half of the debate is, no, monopsony power is not high. Monopsony power is actually low. Well, the factors that would limit monopsony power or suggest that it's low, number one is, think of it in real, the real world in terms of, do you reckon that Tesco can dictate prices to Coca-Cola and Pepsi? No, because what are Coca-Cola and Pepsi? Coca-Cola and Pepsi are massive, massive companies. They're monopolies with strong, strong brand loyalty. Now, it isn't necessarily that you need to be a monopoly, but if you have strong brand loyalty, if you're an established firm like Kellogg's or someone like that, then you can fight back against monopsony power because realistically, they need you as much as you need them. So Tesco are not in a position to turn around and go, oh, we want this particular price, otherwise we won't stock your good because they know how valuable it is for them to have Coca-Cola and Pepsi in their store. So that would limit monopsony power. That's one. Number two, something else that would limit monopsony power is if the suppliers decide to merge. For example, if they merge, that means the bargaining power is stronger for the supplier. It's harder for me to go, oh, if you don't sell it to me, I'll go to the person next door because if you guys now actually are one firm, I can't use that tactic anymore. It limits my monopsony power if suddenly there are fewer sellers in the market and mergers obviously reduce the number of sellers that there are in the market. The third thing that you'd look out for that would suggest that the monopsony power may be high is to question whether the falling profits for suppliers is actually due to monopsony power in the first place. So for example, if profits are falling for a supplier, it could be a plethora of different reasons why it's gone down. So it might be that they are just being really inefficient. So in the extract for June 2012, they talk about how Northern Foods may be just very inefficient and they compare it to other groups like Kerry Group and Cranswick who are other suppliers that are doing just fine. So the fact that monopsony power, um, uh, the, sorry, the fact that profits are falling may not necessarily indicate to us that monopsony power is necessarily high, yeah? The last thing that you might look out for in terms of why monopsony power may not be high. So the CMA can intervene to try and limit monopsony power. A good extract to read is paper one, June 2017, the new spec for uh, Edexcel where they talk about the, uh, the code of conduct, the groceries code of conduct, I think they call it, which tries to limit the degree of monopsony power, or tries to at least protect the farmers up to a certain point. Uh, it's not very successful, but it's, it does an okay job, right? So again, the CMA could potentially step in and intervene and limit the degree of monopsony power that exists in a particular market. So that's the first type of question that you might get, which is um, assessing the degree of monopsony power, assessing whether monopsony power in a market is high or, or not high. The second type of question that you're likely to get is the effects of monopsony power. And there are only three players in uh, the microeconomic perspective that you would need to be looking at when it comes to monopsony power. Number one will be the supplier. Number two will be the consumer, so us buying goods from like Tesco. And number three will be the actual monopsonists themselves. So again, really straightforward because that list that we just constructed now, you just mold it and answer the question in relation to the effects. If I was doing a broad question about the effects and I wanted to talk about the consumer, the producer in terms of Tesco and the supplier, this is what I would do. I would start off with Tesco. I would start off with the monopsonist. So with the monopsonist, the effect for them is that their variable costs will go down, right? Let's now actually draw this on a diagram so that you guys have a, a, a way of constructing this diagram. So I'll do my best to uh, show you guys as I draw along. Cost and revenue diagram. If you do not know how to draw a cost and revenue diagram systematically, honestly, I cannot urge you enough to look through the video that we have on our YouTube page. 
of step-by-step -step approach to constructing a diagram. Right, so axes, as always, you have cost slash revenue on the y-axis and you have quantity on the x-axis. Uh, it is probably advisable to write cost slash revenue. If you're running out of time, you probably can write C slash R, it's fine. But step one is, you should all know, we draw the MC curve, so we just do it. It's a Nike tick. So I just do it, draw that, yeah. Then I draw MR and AR, they're just downward sloping curves. So we've got AR, which we know is equal to demand, and half of the slope is MR, yeah? Now, profit maximization, you all know, is where MC is equal to MR, so we dot down from there. We get our initial quantity, Q1, and I dot up until I hit the AR curve, the demand curve, to now get my price, P1, okay? So I've got Q1, and I've got P1, yeah? Now, I also wanna make sure that I get my costs, so I'm gonna make them make super normal profits. It's set Tesco, supermarket, probably makes sense for them to make you super normal profits initially. So I draw an AC curve like that. It's not the nicest AC curve in the world, but it will do. And then I go up from Q1 until I hit the AC curve, and I get my cost C1. Okay, so my initial super normal profit area, I probably depict this by the way in terms of letters, so I would label this as like A and this point here, uh, sorry, not this point, this point here as B. So what I would say is, I don't know if you can see my B, but there's a B there. I would say the initial super normal profit area was P1, A, B, C1. Okay, everyone with me so far? Now, if variable costs are falling, variable costs, uh, sorry, if, if your monopsony power is increasing, variable costs are falling and variable costs affect both MC and AC. Both marginal cost and average cost will be falling when there is a change to variable costs. And in this context, is it going up or going down? Well, obviously it's going down. From my perspective as Tesco, I'm paying less for my produce. So I'm gonna shift my MC curve down and that's what you do first. Now, obviously you guys don't have the luxury of switching colors in an exam. I do, so I'm going to, just to make it easier for you guys to see. But I'm gonna do it in blue. So I'm gonna draw my MC curve further down, this is MC2, okay? So something like that, okay? Now, before you shift AC, it is imperative that you make sure that you get your new quantity and you get your new price first. This is probably the most uh, kind of messy diagram that you're likely to draw in an exam across the whole of your A-level spec. So we go to where MC equals MR again, but now it's changed. So quantities increase to Q2. And price is now P2, right. So I've got my price, it's gone down and I've got my quantity, it's gone up. The very final thing that I now need to do is I need to reduce my cost as well. So I shift AC down, remembering that it now intersects the new MC curve at, at its lowest point. So I'm gonna just pick like, a random point like here. AC2. And I go up from Q2 until I hit the new AC curve, and that is this C2. Right, okay, it's even, even worse on a board like this, but hopefully you can see what's going on which is this, from the perspective of Tesco, they are going to increase their supernormal profits. And the benefit for them of increasing their supernormal profits, other than the fact that they can pay off shareholders and you know, good things like that, is that they can then invest these supernormal profits into uh, new technology, like new self-checkout machines, or into uh, improving customer services, whatever it might be. But in doing so, that makes the market less contestable it increases their dominance in the market because other firms will struggle to be able to enter the market and compete with Tesco now. So you could do a whole paragraph now, the effect for Tesco is higher profits, higher profits can yield more market share uh, because they can invest the profits into R&D, technological improvements, blah, 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 blah. So that's the uh, Tesco's perspective. The evaluation there is, however, the regulator can step in to limit the degree of monopsony power. The regulator could step in to intervene and ensure that Tesco don't abuse their market power and don't abuse their monopsony power. And so actually it may not see such a decrease in its variable costs. There may not be a fall in its cost in that capacity. So that's, that's one, yeah, one, one, yeah. Um, second uh, analysis would be in relation to the suppliers. Very easy to develop the suppliers. Well, the suppliers Prices are going down, they're being forced down. So even if their costs go up, they're incapable of passing these over to the supermarket. And for some of these suppliers, some of them will need to shut down. They won't be able to survive. You can flesh that out by talking about how AR might be less than average variable cost. Um, so that's a nice, easy development paragraph. You just talk about how you're gonna have less profits and these guys are gonna have to shut down some of them. Evaluation, oh, but they can merge. Some of them might be able to merge or actually some suppliers are gonna be just fine because they have really strong monopoly power themselves. So you can talk about brands like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, et cetera, 
they are not affected by this because they are unlikely to be kind of, uh, they're not likely to see their prices forced down, okay? The last is the consumer, and I refer back to my diagram for the consumer because if you see for the consumer, they actually benefit from monopsony power because can you see prices fall from P1 to P2? Well, and the benefit for the consumer is that as a means of enticing them to buy more from the supermarket, the supermarket will pass on some of the benefits to the consumer in the form of lower prices. So consumer surplus will go up, allocative efficiency is going up, right? Consumer is also benefiting, by the way, from dynamic efficiency if the firm is investing. But I focus my attention mainly on the fact that prices have fallen for the consumer. Yeah? Evaluation to the consumer is a really, really strong evaluation, I feel, is that, however, the supermarket industry, they're also oligopoly, oligopolies, and in particular, Tesco are a legal monopoly, right? Therefore, there's no guarantee that they pass on the benefits to the consumer. In fact, it just solidifies their position in the market. It just gives them more strength and so more monopoly power. And in turn, they might charge higher prices. There's no uh, guarantee that they will reduce uh, prices for the consumer. That's it. Nice and easy. Yeah? All right. Cool. So in terms of uh, questions that I have got posted as well, so can you please go through ways to decrease occupation? Yeah, of course. Cool. Right. Uh, last year's question, the 15 marker for edXL, uh, was a question about how firms and governments can help reduce mobility of labor or improve the mobility of labor. So broadly, you need to understand that there are two types of mobility of labor or two ways in which you can get market failure in the labor market. You need to understand geographical mobility of labor and you need to understand occupational mobility of labor. Well, geographical mobility of labor is the ease with which a worker can move from one area to another to take up a job. So there are certain things that you'd be looking out for in the extract or if it's 25 marker that you can chuck in. Um, one of them is that you can talk about how transportation costs are really important because if transportation costs are, are lower, it is easier for you to be able to go from one area to another to take up a job. So a great example in real world application is HS2. HS2 or Crossrail will basically enable individuals to move very easily. And it doesn't even now need you to go and relocate to a new area. You can just, for example, let's say a job opens up in Birmingham and I'm in London. I can just stay in London, but actually go on the train every day to get to Birmingham fairly easily. So that's one. Another thing that I'd be looking out for for geographical mobility of labor is housing costs. So if I'm a firm, if I want to incentivize people to come and fill vacancies in my area, what I might do is I might subsidize housing. I might say to them, listen, if you come and work for us, we will provide you with a loan that helps you with your accommodation for the first X number of years or even indefinitely. Yeah? Um, that's another one. Uh, another thing that you might want to talk about for mobility of labor from a geographical perspective is um, marital status. So, for example, if someone is married and they have kids, it's harder for them to relocate because they need to look at schooling, they've got friends, family, things like that. Whereas if someone's single, it's much easier for them to just go and relocate. There's nothing, not much stopping them from going, yeah? That's geographical mobility of labor. A very generic and I think very intelligent evaluation in terms of real life now though, is for certain industries and certain jobs, this is less of an issue as it once was because of the internet. A lot of jobs now enable you to work from home. You don't need to physically go into an office. Therefore, mobility of labor, or the geographical mobility of labor is less of an issue now in the labor market for certain industries Obviously, some industries you physically need to go there, like you can't build a house from afar, right? So that wouldn't work there. But for other industries, yeah, absolutely you can, yeah? So that's geographical mobility of labor. Occupational mobility of labor is the ease with which an individual can move from one sector to another to take up a job. So, for example, how easy is it for someone to go from being, a, I don't know, a coal miner to being, um, let's say, a nurse or a doctor, right? Well. There's only one thing really that will improve that, and that's investments into education training. Literally, that is the only thing that you can really develop easily. So you talk about how the government can invest into education and training schemes, and in doing so, they would basically um, uh, improve the occupational ability of labor because people develop the skills required to go into that sector. That's it, okay? Nice and easy. Right, let me have a look at some of the questions that you guys have been posting. Uh, can we go through uh, year two government intervention? Uh, Cool. Right. Year two government intervention, I guess you mean like regulation. That's uh, the, the powers that the CMA has. Uh, the CMA, in terms of the topic, actually isn't that difficult. I think that people typically find it a lot more confusing than it needs to be. Um, firstly, let's start with a definition of what the CMA is and how you would define it in an exam. Um, the CMA, or the Competition and Markets Authority, seek to clamp down on anti-competitive behavior and protect the interests of consumers. 
they basically um, want to make sure the consumers are not being exploited. That's their number one priority is the consumer. Yeah. Now, there are certain things that enable them to be effective at their job, and there are certain powers they have that enable them to be very, very good, and there are certain limitations that are always on the, uh, on the mark scheme. So the factors that suggest that they are powerful, the things that make them effective, number one is that they have the ability to find firms. For example, if a firm is found guilty of colluding, or if they're found guilty of, I don't know, predatory pricing, for example, they could get a very significant fine. So that's number one. Number two is quite an interesting point, and it's often on the mark scheme, which is that just by existing, they're effective because they act as a deterrent. They are, it's like knowing that the police are there. Like you're less likely to commit crime knowing that they're there. So number two is just their existence. Number three is that they can set price caps. Now, price caps come in two forms, RPI minus X and RPI plus K. Right, everyone seems to find this really difficult in terms of understanding the difference between uh, nominal prices and real prices. They had a question in June 2016, question number eight, uh, for the uh, old spec unit three. Uh, and I would recommend you do that. Now, there's a two-step process to figure out nominal prices and real prices. It's really easy. So with me, let's do a little question together. Let's say you get a section eight question, multiple choice question for Excel, And it says that in a given year, uh, the government is imposing a uh, price cap of RPI minus 2%. Hypothetically, yeah? So they are imposing a price cap of RPI minus 2%, and RPI in a given year is equal to, let's say, 5%. Okay? So let's say, hypothetically, that inflation in a given year is 5%. Now, the options will basically be nominal prices will do this, not real prices will do that. Two step process, and you will never get this wrong. Step one if you just plug the numbers into the formula, the answer that you get, that will be the change in nominal terms, always. Whether it's RPI minus X or RPI plus K, always, always, always plug it into the formula and you get nominal. So in this context, well, let's plug it in. It's really, really basic maths where you've got RPI is 5% and X is 2%. So, you know, let's put our maths brain into action. 5 minus 2, obviously 3%. In other words, in nominal terms, the firm has increased its price by 3%. Cool? Right, so far, nice and easy. Real terms is always expressed as real equals nominal minus inflation. Remember that formula, right? Real equals nominal minus inflation. Right. So I can see, yep, right. Well, I now know nominal and I have inflation, so let's plug it in. Well, nominal is 3%. Minus inflation, which, what is RPI? That is inflation, 5%. So 3% minus 5% equals minus 2%. In other words, this firm is worse off in real terms by 2%. And the logic is this, by the way. The logic in RPI minus X is that you force the firms, if they want to maintain their profits in real terms, they have to cut their cost by that X they have to cut costs by 2% because they're not allowed to raise their price above inflation. It's always below it by whatever that X factor is, right? Therefore, if in my example, RPI was 5% and X was 2%, the firm is only allowed to raise its price by 3% in nominal terms. Therefore, they're worse off in real terms by 2%. The only way that they maintain their profits in real terms is by cutting their costs by 2%. That X, by the way, represents X inefficiency. So in other words, it's making sure these firms, usually natural monopolies, will be less X inefficient. Okay, so that's RPI minus X, RPI plus K. They allow them to raise their price above inflation, but only by a certain amount, by the K factor. And they are obligated to then reinvest that percentage of their profits into capital machinery. Cool? That's another power that the regulator has. Another power they have, and what makes them effective, is that they are able to um, set performance targets. So, for example, they might say, if you don't reduce customer complaints by X percentage, we will find you. So that's really good for the consumer and allocative efficiency goes up. Another thing that they might do is set a profit cap. Uh, another thing they can do is ruin the reputation of firms by publicizing their case. You get the point. There's a lot of things that you can talk about. The evaluations that I think are the strongest, the ones that you really want to make sure you do, are number one is regulatory capture. Regulatory capture is a kind of politically correct way of saying they get bribed or they become really friendly with the firm that they are um, investigating. So it's where the regulator and the regulated firm develop a really close relationship and it results in leniency towards the firm. So that's a really big problem. 
Second problem that you might have is asymmetric information that the government doesn't or the regulator doesn't have enough information to appropriately set, let's say, performance targets or appropriately set X for RPI minus X or K for RPI plus K. Okay? Other problems that they have is that you can actually argue that fining is a bit counterintuitive because when you find firms, their profits are falling, but that means they have less money to invest into R&D, so the consumer's worse off in that sense. You're trying to protect the consumer, but in turn, you've kind of harmed the consumer as well, right? So, stuff like that. Uh, that. That would be more than enough to be able to construct really effective answers on regulation and what the regulator can do to try and ensure that uh, you know, the consumers are not being ripped off, basically. Uh, right, so, right, we're getting, getting loads of questions on Facebook. Uh, let me get through as many of these as I can. Um, so, we've got indirect tax. Okay, I'll do tax and subsidies in a bit. Um, predatory pricing and limit pricing diagrams. Right, okay. Um, there are certain diagrams that are prerequisites for your board, whereby they are allowed to ask a question about that, and they expect that diagram. Things like cost and revenue diagram, transition between short and long run perfect competition, uh, indirect taxes, subsidies, externalities, these are all fair game. They cannot ask you about a limit pricing diagram, nor can they ask you about a predatory pricing diagram. And I don't think it makes much sense to actually draw a diagram. I think that you can develop so thoroughly a paragraph about limit pricing and about predatory pricing that it doesn't need a diagram. So let me just go through the two explain it in terms of like a real world application potentially and how you can even develop it so thoroughly that if a 25 mark required you to talk about limit pricing then or, or predatory pricing then you'll be able to flesh it out in more depth so let's start with limit pricing limit pricing is where a firm that's already in the market purposely does not maximize profits in the short run they could but they purposely don't and the rationale behind that is because you want to set your price low enough that if another firm entered the market setting their price at the same level, for that firm, it would be loss making. It would be above, sorry, be below their average cost. Now the rationale as to why you are able to set a low price is because for you, as an existing firm in the market, you can tap into the economies of scale that exist in the industry. So a good example of that is if I'm talking about the supermarket industry, like Tesco, and if there was suddenly like a threat of competition, if I was worried that actually now the barriers to entry have fallen and other firms might be able to enter the market, what I will do is I will reduce my price, but I'm not making a loss to be clear. I am reducing my price low enough that I know that if new firms entered at that price, they wouldn't be able to survive because for them that would be loss making. And the economies of scale now, if I was 25 market, 15 market and I need a bit of depth, I need to give an example of an economy of scale. So I would say, for example, Tesco can tap into purchasing economies of scale. This is where they bulk buy their produce, which reduces the cost per unit. Give an example in the real, real world, like some real world application of what they might bulk buy. So like they might bulk buy eggs, I don't know, tomatoes, something, right? So that therefore means that the price per unit is lower or the cost per unit for Tesco is lower. They're operating at a lower point on their AC curve, right? Now, if it's a 25 marker, I want to develop it even more than that. I can say things like they become more, product they become more productively efficient as they are operating closer to the bottom of the AC curve which is called the minimum efficient scale. Okay, so they're operating closer to the MES. Let's say it's 25 marker and I want to really like flesh it out in terms of depth. I can take advantage as Tesco of my monopsony power and ensure that the prices that I'm charging my consumers are going to be low because I am forcing down the prices that the farmers are getting paid by me, right? All of this is to bring it back to the point about limit pricing, which is if you have a really low price, by having a really low price, not only does it deter other firms from entering the market, what it also does is it increases your sales. You'll get loads of sales now because people are going to buy it because it's so cheap. And in turn, that helps to develop your brand loyalty. Your brand loyalty now acts as a major barrier to entry for new firms. And as a result, in the long run, what you can now do because you've got the strong brand loyalty and people really, really like your product is raise the price, maximize profits, but no one can touch you. No one can enter the market because the market is now less contestable because of the fact that your brand loyalty is so, so strong. Clear? That's limit pricing. Now, uh, predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is different. Predatory pricing is where it's actually illegal, like you're not allowed to do this. It's where an existing firm in the market is trying to drive out another firm that's already in the market as well. The example I always give, for those of you that have come to these courses before, uh, is a pretty horrible example, but, um, so you should have all read Harry Potter at one point. If you didn't, why, well, what's wrong with you? Right, anyway, so, in Harry Potter, there's a really lovable character. Uh, his name's Dobby. Now, 
Dobby, I know Dobby, spoiler alert, but Dobby doesn't make it, but um, let's say that Dobby did make it and decided to open up a news agent. So this is Dobby over here, I'm gonna draw a little news agent. Here's Dobby, right? Dobby sells milk and uh, bread and all sorts of things that news agents sell. Now, across the road from Dobby is Big Bad Supermarket. I'm not gonna name any names, I don't wanna get sued. So, here's Supermarket. Big Bad Supermarket across the road from Dobby, right? Now, they're not too keen. Uh, they're not too happy that Dobby's there because, for example, let's say I wanted to just buy some milk or like some bread, can't bother to go into a massive superstore and go to the correct aisle and uh, which is long. What I'll do is I'll just go into Dobby's, I'll buy it from Dobby, nice and easy, right? Now, hypothetically, let's say that both the supermarket and Dobby are selling milk for one pound. So, hypothetically, the price in Dobby's store is one pound and the supermarket is also one pound. This is what the supermarket will now do. The supermarket will cut the price of its milk so let's say 20p, so that every single carton of milk that they're selling is now loss making. They are on purpose making a loss on every single unit of this item that they are selling. Right, to be clear by the way, that doesn't mean they're making a loss overall. What they can do is they can cross subsidize from other areas. So if I'm a supermarket, I can cross subsidize from other supermarkets like my other chains. I can cross subsidize from other products that I'm selling. So I make enough profit that I can easily cross subsidize, right? This is the, pro the problem though is that Dobby has two options. Option number one is to persevere with a price of one pound. The problem though is that if he has a price of one pound and the supermarket across the road has a price of 20p, now it's worth it. I would go to the supermarket and pay 20p rather than going to Dobby's. Therefore, what will happen? What will happen is, is unfortunately Dobby will die. Dobby is wiped out of the market because he can't absorb the losses. So he can't absorb the fact that no one is buying his milk anymore. Scenario number two is that he tries to cut his price and fight back, so he cuts his price to 20p as well. Can Dobby absorb the losses in the same way that a massive supermarket can absorb the losses? No. So again, what happens to Dobby? Dobby dies. Dobby dies in every single situation. Once Dobby has left the market, once he has shut down and he's been pushed out of the market by the supermarket, what can the supermarket do to its price? Well, it can raise it back up to one pound. In fact, if they wanted to, they could go one pound 10. What can you do about it? There's no choice now. The demand has now become very, very inelastic because of the lack of substitutes available. They have driven competitors out of the market and in doing so, they have maintained or they've increased their market share and increased in turn their profits. Cool? That's how I'd explain. Limit pricing and predatory pricing, no need for a diagram, okay? And to be clear, you don't draw the Dobby thing either. That's just explaining it. Cool, right, what have we got? Can you please explain competitive tendering? Yes, I can explain competitive tendering. Uh, so let's go through that. Um, in order for you to understand competitive tendering, you need, to, you need to understand a broader topic, which is private finance initiative, PFI. So private finance initiative was actually a much bigger topic in the old spec compared to the new spec. It's worth looking at the mark scheme. I wouldn't labor and waste too much time, but January 2013, question number nine in unit three had a whole extract about PFI, okay? And all of the first three questions were all PFI related questions. Now PFI is basically whereby the government uses private companies to build private pu public infrastructure projects. So schools, hospitals, uh, roads, bridges, whatever. An example in real life of a PFI, some of you might even be watching this, that attend this place, that JFS uh, in Kingsbury, that is a PFI. It was uh, built by a private company and what is the rationale behind that? Well, the rationale behind why they would do that, the government, is that they don't have to pay up front for the project. The way it works is that you get companies to bid, so this is competitive tendering, but I'll go into more detail in a sec. You get companies to bid for the right to, to basically build that project. And they essentially lease it to you. So for about 20 to 30 years, you're paying rent as the government every single month for, let's say, the school. And then after the end of the 30 years, you, the government, now take ownership of the asset. It becomes yours, right? So why would a co company do this? Well, from a company's perspective, you obviously will price in a profit. So when I bid for the contract, I ensure that I'm going to be making a profit. And the government knows that. It's not a surprise. But from the government's perspective, because I don't have to pay up front for the project, I can do multiple projects at once. So rather than paying, let's say, 200 million pounds to build a hospital with taxpayer money, what I can do is I can start 10 hospitals in once because of the fact that I'm essentially renting it off these private companies, uh, I can distribute my cost over a longer period of time. Does that make sense? Now, in terms of how the process works, the process works like this. When I, the government, needs something built, like a hospital, 
I will go to the private companies that have a reputation in building these kind of projects or just do kind of publicly and go, you now can submit a bid for this contract. And the firms are not meant to know what the others are bidding. So I, as a potential firm, let's say I, my firm builds hospitals, like that's what we do. I'll bid a contract and I'll say, look, I'll be able to deliver it by this date. I will rent it out to you for 30 years for this amount. Uh, and this is the specification. This is what it's going to look like, blah, 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 blah. Now, more often than not, from the government's perspective, the winning bid will normally be the lowest bid, like whoever's going to be offering it at the lowest price, because the specification is going to be fairly similar. Like the government has a very clear idea, or they might even tell you what they're looking for. Like we have a hospital with these features and this and that. This is the deadline, etc., etc. That's it. That's what competitive tendering is. So competitive tendering is where private companies bid for the right to build a private uh, or public infrastructure project, and the government will be leasing that off them for 20 to 30 years or renting it, the Mark scheme allows both. Uh, and that's it. Uh, the benefits of that also, the private sector tends to be more efficient than the public sector. They are accountable to shareholders, so they want to maximize profits. Um, another benefit is the government doesn't, like I said, have to pay up front for it. Um, the risk is absorbed mainly by the public, uh, sorry, the private company, because let's say, for example, you win the contract, but then as you start the project, you realize that you underestimated how much it's going to cost. Tough. The contract basically says that the government's going to pay you X amount each month. It doesn't change. All right, so that's, uh, that's one of the benefits for the government is that any risk is basically taken on by the private company. Uh, if you don't deliver on time, the government in the contract can basically fine you and, and or not pay you for a certain number of months. Yeah, nice and easy. The, good, the bad things about this, one is that think about how many firms have the capacity and capability of building major infrastructure projects. Not many. So what might happen is, and this happened, I don't remember which country it was, I think it might be Canada, but they can collude with one another. And if they collude with one another, they can all just set a really high price. They all just charge a really, really high price. And then you as the government kind of don't really realize because they all look really similar, the prices that you're being offered. You should go for the lowest, but the lowest is still like a complete ripoff because it's so expensive. So that's one evaluation. Another evaluation is over the long run, actually, the government ends up paying way more. Uh, legally, it is very difficult to get out of these contracts. It's so hard to get out of. So that's it. That's hopefully answered question about competitive tendering. Yeah? Right. Can you go through the shutdown condition? Yeah. Let's do it. So uh, it's worth writing down this uh, as we go along as well. So it's a rule. The shutdown condition is basically where a firm's average revenue is less than their average variable cost. They should shut down straight away. Right. So let's write out the rule. So the rule was AR is less than ABC. Let me just write it down on my board. So I've got AR less than ABC. Okay, so if AR is less than ABC, the firm should immediately leave the market and shut down. Right, now, I don't know about you guys. Personally, my brain doesn't work in terms of averages. I don't think of numbers in terms of their averages. I think of them in terms of totals. So in the exam, you are going to do it as AR is less than ABC because that's what they're going to expect from the mark scheme. But for the purpose of explaining why the shutdown condition is that, I want us to convert it into totals. So we're going to now write TR is less than TVC. In other words, total revenue is less than total variable cost. And it's exactly the same thing. Because if I'm dealing with average revenue and less than average variable cost, it's exactly the same as saying total revenue is less than total variable cost. Okay? Now, let's make up a couple of numbers then. The numbers I want you to plug in are as follows. So I'm going to do TR is equal to uh, 220. Uh, total variable cost is equal to 200. And total fixed cost, let's have it as two, uh, let's have it as 60. Yeah, just 60. OK, so my numbers are as follows. I've got total revenue, TR, is uh, 200. Uh, sorry, 220. Total variable cost is 200. And my total fixed cost is 60. Right, what I want you to figure out for me, please. Is, is this firm, in, based on those numbers, making super normal profit, normal profit, or losses? Right, so let's go through it. A bit weird, no one's here to answer, but let me do it. So, um, profit, you should all know the formula for profit, and this is the definition as well, is TR minus TC. Yeah? Profit is total revenue minus total cost. Well, let's plug it in. My revenue is 220. My total cost is the addition of fixed and variable costs. So my variable cost is 200. My fixed cost is 60. So in other words, my total cost is 260. So 220 minus 260, really basic maths, is minus 40. Okay? 
In other words, this firm is making a loss of 40 pounds. Cool? Now, when a firm is making a loss, the next decision, straight away when we know they're making a loss, is should this firm continue to operate in the market or should it leave immediately? Should it straight away leave the market? Yeah? Well, let's see. If we look at our rule, it says that if your revenue is less than your variable cost, yes, leave the market. But is that the case in our example? No, in our example, total revenue is 220, whereas total variable cost is 200. Right, in order for us to understand that though, let's go through the scenario where you do shut down. So let's see what happens. If you were to immediately leave the market, you shut down straight away, how much, how much revenue are you making? If you shut down straight away, you're not producing anything, so your revenue becomes zero, nothing. You don't make any revenue. So I can almost eliminate, I can basically just pretend that's zero, yeah? Similarly, if I make nothing, if I don't produce any output, what's my variable cost? My variable cost is nothing as well, because variable cost is the cost of producing output, but I'm not producing output. Therefore, again, this is eliminated so that it's, there it is, it's zero as well. But in the short run, and by the way, the shutdown condition is purely a short run concept. In the short run, what do I still have to pay? I still have to pay my rent. I still have to pay my fixed cost. In this case, my fixed cost is 60. Therefore, I would make a loss of 60 pounds. Is it better for me to make a loss of 60 pounds or to make a loss of 40 pounds? Obviously, a loss of 40 pounds. Now, how? How in my example did the loss go down from 60 to 40? Well, if we isolate fixed costs, if we just look, at our variable cost and our revenue, if we just look at the top two. Well, think about it logically. If I make output, and the output that I make generates 220 pounds of revenue for me, but that output only cost me 200 pounds to make, in other words, I have made profit on my output. To be clear, I am not making profit overall. I'm still making a loss, but on the output that I am producing, I am making a profit of 20 pounds that 20 pounds can go towards paying off some of my fixed costs. Hence, my loss went down from 60 to 40 because that 20 pounds that I made went towards paying off some of my fixed costs. That's why when I determine whether to shut down or not, I ignore my fixed costs, by the way, because it's all about, by producing output, am I gonna be making more or less than how much it's gonna to cost to make the output? In other words, is the revenue, the average revenue, higher or lower than the variable cost because if the revenue that I make from selling output is greater than the variable cost, the cost of making the output, I stay in the market because at least some of the money that I make from that, I can pay towards my fixed cost. I can pay off some of my fixed costs that way. But in the other scenario where my revenue was less than my variable cost, so if I change the numbers really quickly, and now let's say I've got TR is, let's do nice these numbers. Let's say we've got TR is equal to 150 and uh, TVC is 160 and TFC is 40, right? So these are my numbers now, yeah? Well, you can clearly see, by the way, that they're making a loss, and they should shut down straight away. And the logic behind why they should shut down straight away is because if I shut down straight away, I would only pay my fixed cost of 40 pounds. Whereas if I stay in the market, according to these numbers, 150, 160, and 40, every unit that I produce, or the total number of units that I produce, I make 150 pounds on the units that I've produced. But it costs me 160 pounds to make it. In other words, I made a loss of 10 pounds on the units I made. Why am I making those units? I don't make those units. I leave the market straight away, pack my bags, and I'm out of here. Yeah? Really good question for you guys to do. As practice is uh, January 2011, I believe. It could be 2012. Pretty sure it's 11. In fact, I'm certain it's 11. Uh, question number two. It has a cost on revenue diagram similar to uh, the ones we drew earlier, but with an ABC, ATC as well. And it basically requires you to understand the shutdown condition. Be very careful with that question, by the way. The wording is very important. It says, assume no change in cost and demand. Why that was important is because if cost and demand aren't changing, that means MC, AC, AR, and MR, none of them change. They don't shift. So work your answer out on the basis of that. I definitely recommend you guys do that question. Right, Whew. next. Can we go through a long question entirely on prisoner's dilemma? Or can we get? Uh, no, I, I would be astonished if you did, but uh, one of the questions that I have seen is in the lot specimen paper for paper one. I want to go through that very quickly, which is um, uh, about a cartel and what is likely to make a cartel successful. So the extract was talking about the oil market and it was talking about OPEC and in particular the main oil supplier or big oil suppliers like the USA. So in terms of that question, it was a 12 market which said 
assess the factors that are likely to make a cartel successful, something along those lines. First, let's understand what a cartel is. You've probably heard about a cartel if you've watched programs like Breaking Bad or Narcos, like in the drugs cartel. But in the context of here, a cartel is basically where there is um, a small handful of firms colluding. It could be individuals, it could be countries as well, colluding to set an artificially high price. So the way in which they collude is actually very important for you to understand because actually that's part of the development of the analysis. The way that we would collude, let's say there are only five firms in a market and we wanted to ensure that the prices are as high as possible. We want to make sure the consumers are being ripped off basically. What we would do is we would all agree to restrict our output because if we restrict our output, that makes the good more scarce. And when the good is more scarce, the price is going to be higher. Yeah. So that's the first thing to understand. Now, in terms of the factors that would make a cartel more successful or increase the likelihood of a cartel being successful, number one, well, you clearly need just a handful of people selling the good. If there are millions and millions and millions of people selling this particular like item, well, it's almost impossible to coordinate and then collude. So it needs to basically be an oligopoly. If you have an oligopolistic market, then yes, you can collude and it's easier for you to have a successful cartel because it's easier to coordinate. That's number one. Number two, another thing that is very likely to make your cartel more successful is you definitely need the biggest supplier to be part of the cartel. Because the biggest supplier, if, for example, if the supermarkets decided to collude, Tesco need to be involved in that collusive agreement, in that cartel. Otherwise, it's very likely to break down because Tesco are in a position where they can undercut everyone so easily and they can easily dominate the market. If they're not part of it and they, ha they have a lower price, they don't need to undercut everyone. If everyone's saying, setting a high price, but Tesco just keep their price like a bit lower, everyone buys it off Tesco, or like Tesco get loads of sales, right? Therefore, you need to ensure that the biggest firm or the biggest supplier in the market is involved in the cartel. So in that case, it was the USA. They needed to ensure that USA and Saudi Arabia were heavily involved in this cartel. Three, another factor that you might look for in terms of what makes a cartel successful is if there is a lack of substitutes, because when you set a high price for a commodity or anything, if there are loads of substitutes available, the cartel is unlikely to be successful because consumers will be like, well, no, thank you. Don't want to buy it at that price. I'll go buy something else. So, for example, if there are alternatives to oil, if there are you know, like renewable energy, shale gas, things like that, then that decreases the prospect of the cartel being successful because of the fact that consumers are not going to accept the higher price. Cool? That's the analysis. Evaluation is basically game theory is a really strong evaluation here, and it's prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma, you should all understand. Um, do you know what? Let's go through prisoner's dilemma actually a little, in a bit more depth. So let's go through a made-up scenario. So let's do a little shout out to someone who actually asked the first question uh, or recommended the first topic, which was monopsony. Max, this is for you, right? So Max, um, imagine that me and Max have committed two crimes. Uh, one is a petty crime. Uh, it's, it's a kind of smaller crime. And then we have also committed a much more serious crime. But the police only have, have enough evidence to charge us for the petty crime. So what they do is they put us into two separate cells. And they go up to Max and say the following. They're like to him, Max, if you confess and Ahmed doesn't confess, then what will happen is, is that we will give you immunity and Ahmed will get 10 years prison time. If both of you confess, then you'll get five years prison time each. If neither of you confess, you'll get two years prison time each. And if Ahmed confesses, but you, Max, you don't confess, then you, Max, you're going to get 10 years prison time and Ahmed will get immunity. Right. Now, I can, I can basically illustrate this game on something called the payoff matrix. A payoff matrix, again, by the way, it's probably something that you are expected to be able to interpret, like in section A. It's unlikely that they will ask you to draw a payoff matrix. It's not that hard anyway. But I'm going to depict on a payoff matrix what I basically described as the game. So we've got player one over here. I'm going to have Max over here. And the two moves for Max were confess and don't confess. I'm going to write don't, just for the sake of saving, saving a bit of time. And then I'm up here. And my moves, again, are the same. They are confess or to not confess. OK. Right, so that's the game so far. Right now, prison time obviously is not a good thing, so we're going to depict it as negative. The way that we can illustrate this, you can even write into the box, like for example, you can write Max gets this, Armour gets this in this scenario. Another way of doing it is that the left number will represent the left player, the right number will represent the top player. Okay, so 
If Max confesses and I confess, both of us are going to get five years prison time. So I'm going to put minus five, minus five to illustrate the fact that we both go to prison for five years. Now, in this scenario where Max doesn't confess, but I do confess, well, Max is in trouble now because he's going to get 10 years prison time and I am going to get complete immunity. I get nothing. Yeah? Vice versa, if he confesses and I don't confess, now he gets immunity, I get 10 years. And then the last scenario is that neither of us confess, so we both just get two years because they can only charge us for the petty crime. Right, so my payoff matrix looks like this. And this is an example of prisoner's dilemma. We're going to go through the game and figure out the outcome. Now, if you didn't know Max and I, and you could just choose of the four options, the best outcome for us mutually. There's such a blatant option. The blatant option is that we don't confess. We both play don't confess, don't confess, and we only get two years prison time each. What we're gonna illustrate is that that will never ever be the equilibrium. That is an unstable equilibrium. So let's go through why. The way that we can figure out the game and find what we call the Nash equilibrium, just a fancy way of saying the outcome of the game, is by playing the game. And we're gonna initially play it from the lens of Max. So we're gonna pretend that we're Max first. And Max is going to assume initially that I play confess. So we can cover my don't confess. So cover that, yeah, as best as I can, yeah. Now, from Max's perspective, if I'm playing confess, is it better for him to play confess and get minus five or to not confess and get minus 10? Well, obviously it's better for him to confess because by confessing minus five is obviously better than minus 10. So I'm going to underline his move. So that's the move that he plays in that scenario. Scenario number two is the I, we're still Max, but now he assumes that I don't confess. If I don't confess, is it better for him to confess and get zero or for him to confess and get minus two? Well, again, it's to confess. It's zero is obviously better than minus two. Did you notice something? Did you notice that in both scenarios, Max played confess irrespective of what I did? He has what we call a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is where you play a particular move irrespective of what the other player is doing. It doesn't matter whether I play to confess or don't confess, it was always better for him to play confess. Right, now let's twist the game very quickly and play it from my perspective. If Max were to confess, is it better for me to be playing confess and getting minus five or to not confess and get minus 10? Well, obviously it's better for me to play confess, so I play that as well. Scenario number two, if Max doesn't confess, is it better for me to confess and get zero or to not confess and get two, minus two? Obviously I confess again as well. In other words, both of us are going to confess. Our dominant strategy for both is to confess. Therefore, we're going to reach what we call a suboptimal outcome. We're both going to play uh, confess, confess, and be at minus five, minus five. We're both worse off. Now, normally when I first teach that to someone, uh, they think, yeah, well, that's great. That's interesting. That's, that's cool. How does that have anything to do with theme three? How does that have anything to do with economics, though? The reason why that has everything to do with economics is this, though. If this didn't say Max and Ahmed and didn't say confess and don't confess, instead it said Tesco, Asda, collude or high price, high price, low price, low price, like you got high price and low price. The collusive agreement for the firms is what was in our, in our example, minus two, minus two, when we both didn't play confess, when we didn't confess. But that is an unstable equilibrium. It is very likely that one or both of these firms will break out of the collusive agreement and rather than them basically playing high price, high price, over time, they're going to end up in a mutually destructive price war. They're going to undercut one another. They're going to start cutting each other's prices. And the rationale is as follows. If I'm Asda, I think, oh, man, if I increase my output and reduce my price, I undercut Tesco. And so I'm going to get some of their customers. So I make profits. But Tesco think the exact same thing. They go, oh, if we undercut Asda, we're going to get loads of profit. And so they both end up cutting each other's prices and end up in a mutually destructive price war. That's the first reason why a collusive agreement might break down because of the fact that there's always an incentive to undercut your rival and gain market share or gain profits at their expense. The other reason why a collusive agreement might break down and why it's unstable over the long run is because of, I mean, I wouldn't do it for the context of that question for the locked specimen because it was countries. If it were firms, well, one of the most effective ways of regulation is whistleblowers. A whistleblower is someone that basically basically snitches. They go up to the regulator and go, yeah, sorry, we were involved in a collusive agreement. This is all the evidence. Uh, but why would you do that? You would do that because you get immunity. You get immunity if you're the one that goes and basically does the snitching. Therefore, the whistleblower, there's always an incentive to be the whistleblower because you're worried that the other firm will be the whistleblower. Collusive agreements, therefore, are very, very unstable. They're unlikely to survive into the long run because of the fact that 
just it just it doesn't make sense to stay in that equi equilibrium because we can make more profits by undercutting. And then the other firm does that as well. They end up in a price war. Is that clear? That's a really strong evaluation for that as to why it may not actually kind of survive into the long run uh, because of the fact that it's unstable. Yeah? So that's one of the evaluations that I could talk about. Um, cool. Right. Next. What else have we got? Um, all right. I'm doing my best to answer as many of these questions as I possibly can. Um, how should we develop opportunity cost to government evaluations for micro? Okay, right. Um, I would not have that as one of my evaluations if I could avoid it, to be really honest with you. It's a weaker evaluation. If it's a data response and you have data and it tells you how much the government's spending, by applying it and then explaining that's an opportunity cost, that's higher level, that's at least, at least middle level, it's better. Um, I would try and avoid generic statements of just opportunity cost to the government. It's just a very weak point. It's gonna be like lower level. So um, I think it's just important to have a bit of context. If you feel that there isn't context, you can just develop it into a twofold point, which is like magnitude. So the impact on, for example, the government subsidizing farmers depends on how large the subsidy is. And the larger the subsidy, the bigger the opportunity cost. So there's a trade-off for the government. The smaller the subsidy, the less effective it is. But at the same time, the larger the subsidy, the bigger the opportunity cost. That's a little bit better, yeah? Right, how do you want to explain how Okay, right, so the question about marginal revenue product theory, um, this is exclusively for those of you that are um, AQA. Those of you that are Excel, it's still relevant to you, but it's not something that they would ask in that wording. So the question is, how MRP theory determines the wages paid to workers? Okay, well, marginal revenue product is made up of two parts. It's made up of marginal physical product and marginal revenue. So let's just really talk about the kind of diagram. Marginal revenue, we should all know, for a firm to be able to incentivize you to buy an extra unit, unless they're operating in perfect competition, they need to offer you a lower price. So in order for me to sell one more unit, I will need to entice you by a lower price, yeah? Marginal physical product is how much output each individual worker produces. So if I add, for example, chefs to a kitchen for a restaurant, if I add more, I don't know, laborers for building a house, whatever it might be, what will happen is this, it will actually take this shape where it initially starts, it goes up and then it goes down. Why? Because the point at which the marginal physical product starts to go down is the law of diminishing returns is set in at that point. It's the idea that we've got too many workers, they're starting to get in each other's way. Now, output still rises, but the rate at which it's rising is decreasing. So if you notice, it's still positive, but it's now decreasing. Every single unit, every single unit of labor is actually resulting in less output compared to the unit before that. Yeah? So, the maths in terms of like putting all of this together, again, to be clear, this is mainly AQA guys. Uh, MRP, marginal revenue product, is equal to marginal physical product, MPP, times marginal revenue. Right? So, in other words, if I'm a firm, the determining factor of whether I demand workers or don't demand workers, or how many workers I demand, is one, how out much output those workers produce or how productive they are, and two, how much demand there is for the good. Because if you remember, AR and MR always shift together. So if I can, can draw an AR curve into my diagram as well. So I've got this AR equal B. And then it becomes really straightforward. So for example, um, if there is a craze whereby there's suddenly high demand for a good, a good example of that is uh, like fidget spinners about two years ago, everyone was like crazy about fidget spinners. Um, I wouldn't have the foggiest idea what the latest craze is. I'm not into fashion at all, as you can see from my attire. But anyways, um, if anything becomes fashionable, anything increases in demand, then because labor is derived demand, it leads to more demand for uh, workers. So again, wages are gonna go, go up. Because if I draw a supply and demand diagram, just a really simple one for labor, uh, let me just quickly draw it, then anything that shifts the demand is going to affect labor. So that's obviously gonna cause wages to go up. So if I've got wages here and quantity of labor here, supply of labor and marginal revenue product, which is demand for labor. And demand shifts out. Okay, right. So I'll show you guys my diagram in two seconds. This, basically. Yeah? No make sense? So that's uh, an example of demand shifting outwards uh, and quantity increasing. 
So that's one of the things that I could discuss as part of the analysis there. Another is marginal physical products. So for example, productivity of the workforce. If the government invests into education and training schemes, it means that workers may become more productive and therefore more sought after. And as a result, that would affect the demand for labor. And again, wages will be determined in that way. Whereas in contrast, even if someone is super productive, but that industry is declining and there's no demand for that good, and then it doesn't matter. I'm not going to just employ, hypothetically, let's say, for example, like a coal miner now. There's much less demand for coal in the UK as there was like, you know, in the 1970s. So even if you found the most talented coal miner in the world, like amazing, there isn't enough appetite for it. So it doesn't make sense to hire those individuals. Make sense? Hopefully that kind of answered the question. Uh, can I go through the principal agent problem? Yes, I can go through the principal agent problem. Right. Okay. So um, very small topic. This is in both AQA and at Excel, OCR as well. Um, in order for you to understand the principal agent problem, you need to understand something more broad, which is the divorce of ownership. The divorce of ownership is a very straightforward idea. It's that as a firm grows in size, the individuals who set the company up are no longer the people that are running it on a daily basis. So Mark Zuckerberg, when he set up Facebook, he is no longer running Facebook on a daily basis. He isn't like coordinating everything and like managing. He's got people working on his behalf. This therefore gives rise to something called the principal agent problem. The principal are the shareholders, so the people that set up the company or have shares in the company, and the agent is the manager who works on their behalf. Now, the problem that arises is that their objectives may not align. So for example, the principal clearly, they want the firm to be maximizing profits because their dividends depend on that. The agent though, the salary that you get paid as the manager may be independent of the profits that are being made by the firm. It might be, for example, that if you maximize revenue or maximize sales, then actually that may lead to a higher bonus for you or it might lead to you keeping your job. There is asymmetric information though. The people running the business on a daily basis, so the agent, has more information about the business than the individuals that used to run it before, the principal, right? The shareholders don't really know what's happening on a daily basis. They're not in the office to see whether everyone is being really productive or whether, I don't know, people are taking like really long breaks and just being really inefficient, right? Therefore, it gives rise to a particular type of behavior which is called profit satisficing. Profit satisficing is basically the idea that a firm or a, a manager makes just enough profits to satisfy shareholders, but they don't maximize profits. So the principal doesn't really know because they see profits being made, but they don't know that it's being, not being maximized. So they don't, they're none the wiser. But the agent knows that they could have maximized profits, but they purposely just don't because for them, it requires a lot more effort and a lot more work. And maybe their salary is not linked to profits. That's it. Okay, so that's the principal agent problem. Um, with uh, regards to um, the principal agent problem and profit satisficing, to be clear, it is not a particular point. So you don't know exactly where it is. Like it's just not at profit maximization. Yeah? Uh, one easy evaluation for that, like to double evaluate, I guess, or evaluate that, is uh, there are examples of firms that pay their staff with shares. They give them shares in the company as a means of incentivizing to ensure that this is an issue. Uh, John Lewis and Waitrose, who are owned by the same company, uh, they do that. Yeah, so that's an example of um, how the principal agent problem can be kind of overcome. Cool? Right. Please, can you go through the conditions for utility maximization? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by uh, conditions for utility maximization. I mean, rational economic, uh, uh, classical economists believe that individuals seek to maximize their utility. The factors that would influence utility. Uh, are it's like satisfaction. So, for example, if you save money on an item, utility's gone up, therefore that's rational behavior. If you do something like switching, let's say, from cigarettes to e-cigarettes because it's healthier potentially, that's, again, utility maximization. Uh, I don't know if that actually answers it, but that, is that kind of okay? Right. Uh, uh, if there's a question asking you to compare if one policy is more effective than the other, for example, subsidy versus minimum price, do you need to compare directly in each point you make or just in the judgment? Very, very fair question. Um, right, there's a bit of a uh, similarity and difference between AQA and Edexcel, so let me answer it separately. Uh, those of you that are Edexcel, uh, it's perfectly fine for you to have one half of your essay exclusively looking at, let's say, subsidies, the effects and how good it is. Uh, making sure you're answering the question as well, like as in talking about the effectiveness in relation to whatever they said it's effective for. Then evaluating that, doing minimum price scheme, evaluating that, and then in the judgment talking about which one's more effective. That's fine. You don't, not, you don't need to constantly be talking about, oh, it's more effective than this because of that. You can do that, that's okay. But bear in mind that you, it's probably easier for you to construct an essay where you go, these are all the benefits, 
And these are the costs, the bad things. These are the benefits of the minimum price scheme. These are the bad things. And then the judgment, which is better, yeah? AQA, your 25 markers, it's more discussion-based. And so actually, you guys can do it in a way where you float around a little bit more. I probably would still stick to the method of kind of one evaluate, one and evaluate. But um, it's more discussion-based. And actually, what they're looking for is the level of kind of depth that you bring to the debate. And so it's not a bad idea to constantly be talking about this side versus that side and the effectiveness of this. But this is limited by that. So um, you, it's more open-ended for you, I guess, to do stuff like that. Okay. Right. Uh, you can use a payoff matrix, yes, you can use a payoff matrix uh, to show why collusive agreements can break down, yep. Um, for 25 markers, when they say use a particular industry, how much context is needed? Okay, um, 25 markers is the, are the, the one question where you are expected to throw in real world knowledge because there's no extract other than in paper three. And so it is worth knowing a couple of things here and there, but you'd be surprised about how much you already know. So you already know, for example, that Tesco invest profits and therefore have issued things like self-checkout machines. You already know that new companies have entered into the supermarket industry, especially if you've done revision and you've done past papers, because all the extracts that you do in the data response, they're all factual information. It's all real things. Um, it's even worth actually reading the extracts, not necessarily doing the questions, but reading the extracts for other exam boards. For example, AQA had a really good extract in June 2017, paper one, about um, the uh, privatization of the raw mail and how it's led to you know, certain problems and also certain like, you know, good things for consumers. It's great, because this is all real world knowledge, right? June 2017, for um, paper one for Edexcel, their data response was about the supermarket industry and how other firms have started to enter the market and started to take a chunk of the market, like Lidl and Aldi, this kind of low budget supermarkets. So you know that, that's another thing that you know. You know, for example, that um, it, Apple were accused of abusing their market power because they admitted to slowing down you know, older models of the iPhone when they do software updates. So you do know stuff. You know a lot more than you realize, right? So just be aware that you know, you're, you're good. You, you can be fine, yeah? Um, yes, you do. So it's useful to know some context. Now, we actually have um, one of our amazing tutors put together a, uh, a number of booklets for case studies. Problem is, uh, we are trying to put it up on our website, but it's really not happening at the moment. My developer hasn't got back to me. Um, if you just send, please, uh, those of you that have my number, send me a message. But those of you that don't, can you just leave uh, a message on, on Facebook? Send a message or, as a private message with your email address, please. Uh, we will send over a number of booklets. All of them have um, case studies that you guys can use. There's like really summarized, like it's nice and easy to like just know a couple of things here and there. Yeah, cool. Right, so that hopefully answers that question. Right, let's have a look. What else have we got? Uh, uh, productive efficiency. When you're talking about productive efficiency, you're just talking about it from the static perspective of you are operating at the lowest point on the AC curve. In other words, you have fully exploited all the economies of scale that exist in that industry. So if a firm grows in size, they might be a better place to tap into economies of scale. If they merge with another firm, that might increase productive efficiency as well, right? Um, typically, it's not likely that productive efficiency is in and of itself going to be the question. It's more like the effect of a merger on efficiency or the effect of a demerger on efficiency. Or it might be the effect of um, a certain market structure, whether there is more or less efficiency in that market structure. Yeah, so that's pretty easy. Uh, buffer stock schemes is macro now. It used to be micro. It is no longer uh, micro. It is now macro. It's in theme four. So I will um, do that uh, ASAP. Yeah. Uh, right. What else have we got? Let me go select. I'm going to go through selective questions. I, I didn't do tax and X analysis. I'll do that in a second. I uh, also need to go home eventually. Um, is welfare some surplus? Increasing the level of prices. Okay, fair question. Is welfare the same as a surplus or not? Does welfare increase in a monopoly if prices are raised and consumer surplus decreases? Okay, cool, right. Uh, welfare is a fairly broad um, concept, I guess. But when we're talking about it from the perspective of the consumer, consumer welfare is both in terms of price and in terms of quality as well. So we're not talking about allocative efficiency. It is a static point. It's where MC is equal to AR. But beyond that as well, it's actually that whenever the consumer is better off, you're going to say allocative efficiency goes up, right? That's our rule. Every single time consumers are better off, they get a lower price, they get a higher quality, you're going to say allocative efficiency is going to go up. So from a monopoly perspective, 
If monopolies are setting really high prices, then allocative efficiency is low, and therefore, you know, the consumer welfare is, is low as well. But then if they invest the profits and increase the quality of the good, yes, then welfare does go up because consumer welfare is increasing. They're getting the wider choice of goods. They're getting the higher quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Um, what else have we got? Uh, when they ask a 25 marker, they sometimes give a bit of context before the question. In the essay, can you still give other real world examples rather than always referring just to the context given? Fair. It depends on the question, but more often than not, yes. If it says to the industry that they have mentioned, then stick to the industry. But obviously, you can still broaden it out and say loads of things about that industry. It doesn't have to be specifically just, you know, uh, the benefits to, or let's say the statement was like investments into like self-checkout machines for supermarkets. is an example of them investing profits. That's not the only thing they invest their profits into. So you can talk about loads of other things as well. Um, so try, if it says to an industry of your choice, to brought, just specifically talk about maybe the industry they've given, unless you know a lot of things about your industry. But um, you can normally talk about other things as well. It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely fine. Any real world topics that you think could come up in the extracts? <laughs> um, right, so I, I guess the rephrasing that is what are my predictions for what's going to come up in your paper? Um, to be clear, I, I genuinely don't know. And it's just based on the fact that they haven't asked many questions about this is specific about Excel. Um, they haven't asked many questions about this, or they haven't asked any of their big topics. But, 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 whenever I do this, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you revise everything because everything can be asked, especially in the new spec where you've got three sections. There's also section A that you need to contend with, there's also paper three where they can throw stuff at you with anything from any of the themes. I, I think that. The topics that make most sense for them to ask a question on, one, contestable market theory. They have not asked a big question on that at all so far, and it's a big topic. Two, price discrimination, and I can also see them potentially doing that as a 25 marker. I feel like I'm pretty certain in the last live Q&A session I went through that question. So if you missed that, you can go back on our YouTube page and see that session. Um, in terms of the theme one topics for micro, they haven't really asked a question about subsidies, like a big question, so that's quite topical and that could be asked, and minimum price schemes. Um, if they were doing subsidies and minimum price schemes, I think it would make sense as a smaller question for them to talk about, because the UK is leaving the EU, the effect of removing subsidies. Like if the, um, the EU suddenly stops giving uh, UK farmers subsidies, what is the effect of that? So it's like a reversal of subsidies, like you can just go backwards from that. Um, those are the type of things that I think could potentially be uh, asked. But by, honestly, I, I don't know. They can ask anything. They can ask you... Just because, for example, they asked the 25 marker on tax in June 2017 doesn't mean it can't be asked again. They got asked again last year in paper three as an eight marker. They can ask anything. They can do anything. I also feel like there's a possibility that they will ask a big question about behavioral economics. Um, they haven't yet. It's, it's a very interesting topic. And uh, if I have time, I might actually go through that. Go through like an essay on that. Let me write it down. Okay, cool. Right. Next, let me see what else we've got. Uh, I might set some of my own questions as well. I'll try and answer as many of your questions as I can in the time we have. Uh, if a question is asked on how to commit negative, how would you structure the essay? How would you find negative externalities? Okay, right. Right. Um, if the question is asking about how you combat negative externalities, how would you go about structuring the essay? Okay. Uh, that's nice and open-ended, by the way, because it's basically dealing with the externality from the perspective of it being over-consumed. But you can also do paragraphs about the substitute goods being under-consumed, so positive externalities. Let's deal with that, because that was asked earlier as well, how I draw the diagram. Now, negative externality, uh, for those of you that are at Excel, you only need to know two diagrams, negative, essentially, production, and positive consumption. Those of you that are AQA, you also need to know two other diagrams, which is you need to know positive production externality, and you also need to know negative consumption externality. Um, so I'm going to do it from the perspective of Edexcel, just because typically we have more students for Edexcel. But please, please, please feel free to message directly on the Facebook page, and uh, as in private message, and I will uh, send over my answer uh, with more detail for you guys that are AQA. But actually, the theory is going to be the same. There's not much difference between these. So in terms of an externality diagram, systematic approach to constructing the diagram. So we're going to have quantity on the x-axis, cost slash benefits on the y-axis. Right. Now, the first question you ask yourself is, is it a negative externality or a positive externality? For those of you that are at Excel, by the way. Um, well, it's negative, therefore, is that to do with costs or benefits? Well, obviously costs. 
Therefore, I'm going to draw two slightly pivoted upper sloping lines like that as step one. If I have two upper sloping lines, it follows that I must only have one downward sloping line. That's the next step. So I draw that. But at this point, I haven't labeled anything but the axes. Because I only have one downward sloping line, I can label that straight away. And in every single externality, there are always two players. There are the private party, the person doing the thing that causes the externality, and then everyone else, society, which we call social. So we're going to call it M P B equals M S B. Okay, so we're assuming that our costs are con our, sorry, our benefits are constant. Our analysis is just focused on the cost. Now, the next step is very, very important when you draw this diagram. Can you see that there are two points of intersection there and there? What I'd like you to do all the time is dot down and across from those two points of intersection. Don't do anything yet before that point. Okay, so those are our two points of intersection. The next thing that you ask yourself is, is it a negative externality or a positive externality? Well, it's negative. Negative means that we are doing too much of something that's bad. Positive externality is where you're doing too little of something that's good, right? Well, think about the equilibrium quantities. I've got number one and I've got number two. So number one, again, sorry, number one and number two. Which one obviously is where you're doing too much? Well, obviously it's the second one, it's the one where it's further along, so that must be equilibrium. Label that QE, please, straight away. QE and the adjoining price PE. The other quantity we're gonna label Q star, you can label it QS if you want to, don't mind. I'll explain what it is in a second. Now, now that I know the equilibrium quantity, I can put my pen on the equilibrium point, which is there. We all agree with that, with that point? Can you see that there is only one upward sloping line going through that exact point right there? That must be a private line. The only way that equilibrium occurs in an externality is where private cost equals private benefit. Therefore, I'm going to label that line MPC. And the other line must therefore be MSC. Cool? So that's what we have as an externality straight away. Now I need to correct it. Well, if people are doing too much of something, what should you do as the government? The very obvious form of government intervention here is either a tax, that's probably the one I would do, or pollution permits if it's they're producing something and in the process it's leading to high levels of pollution. So let's deal with it from the perspective of a tax. Well, knowing from a supply and demand perspective, what is happening to tax, uh, what happens to supply, sorry, when there's a tax? Well, supply shifts inwards and parallel, right? So what I'm gonna do, in this context, the supply curve is marginal private cost, MPC, and the demand curve is marginal private benefit. So what I want to do is I want to shift my MPC curve, this, right to the point of social optimum Q star. So I'm going to do it on mine, I'll show you once it's done. Shift it parallel right through that point. MPC plus tax, okay? MPC plus tax, and I have now corrected the market failure because the output that is being produced is now the social optimum quantity which is what we want to be at, is Q star, yeah? Is that clear? So that's how I deal with it uh, in terms of that. Now, in terms of how I construct this, one of the paragraphs is to talk about tax and how it internalizes the external cost associated with this particular demerit good. You explain like how this causes MPC to shift inwards, quantity falls from QE to Q star, the whole, whole paragraph can be constructed on this. You can make another paragraph, by the way, about tax and again, why it's effective. One of the cool words that you can throw in, some of you get, I think, too excited by this word, but it's that they can hypothecate the tax revenue. What that means, it's a fancy way of saying that the government pledges that whatever tax revenue they generate on the tax of that good, they spend it back on that market failure. So for example, if I tax cigarettes and I pledge, so I hypothecate the tax revenue, I pledge to invest all of the money that I generate as the government from that tax back on the problem. So like awareness campaigns, I might subsidize, I don't know, like nicotine patches so it's easier for people to quit, it's cheaper for them to buy those patches. That would be another paragraph that I could do. And then literally just evaluate by talking about the limitations. So that's positive externality, neg uh, negative externality, sorry. Let's do positive externality really quickly. Um, so again, let's do the step by step for the diagram. Right, so diagram. Cost slash benefits on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis as always. And again, if it's a positive externality, we're dealing with benefits. We're looking at it from the perspective of the consumer, and so demand. And so we're going to do slightly pivoted downward sloping lines. Nothing too steep, because you'll see it's going to mess up if that's the case. If I have two downward sloping lines, it follows that I must only have one upward sloping line. So I can label that MPC equals MSC. Is that clear? So that's the starting point. 
Now again, can you see that there are two points of intersection between those curves? So I dot down from the two points and then dot across. And now I ask myself the following question. Is it a positive externality or negative? Well, it's positive, meaning that are they doing too little or too much? Well, they are doing too little. So in other words, the equilibrium quantity must be number one. That must be the equilibrium. So I'm going to label that QE. So I do that QE, the other one I do is Q star, and then PE and P star, yeah? Again, I put my pen on the equilibrium point now that I know what it is. So can you see my dot there? You see that line going through that equilibrium point, the downward sloping line that hasn't been labeled? That line, one million percent, must be marginal private benefit. It has to be a private line, because it wouldn't be equilibrium otherwise, MPB. And therefore, the other one is MSB, okay? And welfare gain is basically where I put my pen on the equilibrium and I draw until I connect to a line, well, it's this. This is what society, you can write it as potential welfare gain. Well, society could be gaining, but they are not gaining. Okay, so this is potential welfare gain. Now, this one is a bit more interesting in terms of how it would work, because the idea is, is that this good is under-consumed or under-provided in a free market, so it's a merit good, right? So the government intervention to deal with this should be a subsidy. I need to subsidize this good, because by subsidizing it, two things will happen. One is that the price the consumer is being charged for the good should go down to incentivize them to buy at the social optimum quantity, number of units. But the second thing that's going to happen is the government needs to find out how much they need to pay the producer in order for them to actually produce Q star units. Now, the way that I figure out where I shift my supply curve to, and remember again that supply is MPC, marginal private cost, is that I go to where it dots up from Q star. So if I go to Q star, I dot up until I hit MPB, marginal private benefit, because that's the demand curve. I need to shift my supply curve right to that point there. Because if I shift it right there, what will happen is, is that we are now at the equilibrium achieving Q star. That's what I want. I want to make sure that we're selling or consuming Q star units. I'm going to shift mine right to this point, parallel. And I get MPC plus sub C D. Okay? I get MPC plus subsidy. Can you see that it intersects the MPB line exactly, exactly there? So that's the new quantity. And the new price, by the way, dot across, call that like P2 or something, is the price the consumer is actually paying for the good. It goes down. Now, how much does the government subsidize? Now, in a subsidy diagram, the way you calculate the subsidy rate is you put your pen on the equilibrium, the new equilibrium, and you draw a straight line up until you hit the old supply curve. Well, here, if I put my pen on the new equilibrium there, and I draw a straight line up until the old MPC curve, in other words, the old supply curve, you see that distance there, if I put it as like an arrow, that is how much the government must be subsidizing per unit. Okay? Is that clear? Cool. Right. Hopefully that's well. Obviously. Right. Uh, before I answer some of the other questions about um, that you guys are posting on uh, Facebook, I'm getting questions on my phone as well. So quickly, let me just look through my phone, answer as many as I can in the time that I have. Um, Okay, question eight, unit three, June 2016. So I, I flagged this up earlier, it was the RPI one. Uh, so for those of you that have a laptop in front of you, uh, get that question up. I'm sorry, I, I wish I had it in front of me to like put on the screen for you guys to see. I will read it out uh, so that you can also see it. Uh, you can find past papers on our website. So if you go on expert-intuition.co.uk, if you click on A-level economics under past papers, in fact, we have them broken down by topic for edXL as well. So those of you that are edXL, you can revise by going through booklets of questions, they have all the mark scheme next to them, they're very easy to use. Um, so yeah, basically use our website. So anyways, uh, so it was unit three, June 2016, question number eight. Right, let me put that up and get the exact wording. All right, so the question says the following. In 2014, the UK government announced that there would be a change in the price cap on regulated rail fares, rail fare increases, sorry. The price cap changed from RPI plus 1%, to RPI plus zero. Assuming changes in RPI are positive, regulated fares will, right. Underline key words here. Obviously this is RPI plus K, and you need to underline that, that last statement, assuming RPI changes are positive. Okay, you know all the stuff that happened beforehand where it was RPI plus one? They often do this, whereby 
they give you utterly irrelevant rubbish to try and make your life more difficult, to make it seem more confusing. The only thing we're dealing with here is RPI plus zero. So straight away, let's write out the formula, and it goes RPI plus zero percent. Okay? Now, the question doesn't give us what RPI is. It just says assuming RPI is positive. So what I think is a good idea is to plug in a random number. As long as it's positive, it will answer this. So let's do RPI is equal to 4%. So together, let's do it. So let's say RPI is equal to 4%. Remember what I said. You plug it into the formula to calculate nominal first, and then we do real equals nominal minus inflation. So let's do nominal first. Well, if I plug it in, 4 plus 0 obviously equals 4%. So in nominal terms, the firm is raising its price by 4%. In other words, it's not, nominal price is changing equivalent to the price. Yeah? Real. Real equals nominal minus inflation. So I've got my nominal like this. I did 4 plus 0 equals 4%. That's nominal. Now, I now know, know nominal and I know inflation. So I do nominal was 4%. Minus, well, what was RPI in my made-up example? It was also 4%. So 4 minus 4 equals obviously 0%. There's no, there's no change in real terms. In real terms, there's no change. So let's, let's do it with another number just to make sure. Like as in, I mean, it would just do the same thing, but let's say that RPI instead was, I don't know, 7%. Let's do that. So if RPI is 7%, let's figure out what happens. So again, you plug it into the formula with, with me, please. So RPI equals 7%, 7% plus 0%, obviously is, is 7, so let's say zero, 0. So in normal terms, they raise their price by 7%, again, equivalent to the price. Inflation is 7%, nominal is 7%, 7 minus 7 equals, again, 0. Let's look through our options there. So in terms of the options in the multiple choice for that question for Edexcel, a, rise by 1% in nominal terms. Well, not necessarily. That'll only happen if the price RPI was 1%. We don't know what RPI is, so we can't say definitively that that's the case. So A is incorrect. Rise by 1% in real terms. No, we just showed that in real terms it doesn't change. Remain unchanged in nominal terms was option C. This was the most commonly selected incorrect answer that year. No, because as I illustrated just now, when RPI was 3%, the firm changed its price by 3%. When RPI was 7%, the firm changed its price by 7%. C is incorrect. The correct answer is D. Remain unchanged in real terms. Yes, because it doesn't change. We plugged it into two separate equations, and in both situations, RPI in real terms. So um, in real terms, it was 0%. Now, E was also one of those that a lot of people fell for. Fall by an amount equal to the changes in RPI. Well, that would be true in nominal terms, but it can't happen because it says RPI changes are positive. So it can't be negative. So E is also incorrect. Yeah, hopefully that clarifies that question. Right, let me quickly look at my phone to see some other questions. My throat is drying up. Right, let me see what I've got. Um, privatization and nationalization. Okay, cool. Right, let's just deal with that. Uh, one of the topics that um, I know that uh, I think it's Econ Plus Dal, uh, who's very good by the way. I highly recommend you guys watch his videos. Um, he, uh, I think, did a couple of like topical things that may come up. There are two things that I think I'd like to go through with you guys to make sure that you at least have some points in the back of your mind in terms of how you go about answering those questions. Just because they are fairly topical, it's not that I necessarily think that they are going to be asked. And this is both for those of you that are AQA as well as Edexcel, actually pretty much all the examples at this stage. The first is in relation to imposing a maximum wage. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn is a big advocate of ensuring that those who are the highest earners in an organization can make no more than 20 times the lowest earner in an organization. And the question could be like a data response, and it could say, analyze the effectiveness of this or analyze the effect of imposing a maximum wage on the market. So let's go through that together. The way that I would go about this is I'd start it off by drawing the diagram. I'll explain what a maximum wage is. So maximum wage, similar to maximum price, same thing, but now I'm contextualizing it to the labor market. A maximum wage is a maximum wage that a firm can pay its workers on an hourly basis, a legal maximum that they can pay its workers on an hourly basis. Now, in terms of the labor market, a very simplistic diagram, supply and demand. So if I draw on the axes, I've got wages over here, and I've got quantity of labor on the x-axis. The supply of labor, and you can do the demand for labor. Yeah, so a very simple diagram like that. Label the initial equilibrium. You can do it as like QE. 
W E. Yeah. Well, now a maximum wage. You need to remember where to set the maximum wage. So it's always below the equilibrium. Otherwise, it wouldn't have any effect. If it were above, you just get excess supply, which would signal to you that your wage is too high, and therefore you need to reduce your wage so that people stop applying. Like they need to calm down. But you, that's not the case here. What we're trying to do is we're going to set a maximum wage like above, so below the equilibrium here. So max wage. That. And I'm going to call it W1. Cool. So that's my maximum wage. Now, as always, whenever I have a wage or a price, I dot across until I hit a particular curve and then I dot down from that curve. So I've got Q1, I've got Q2. I'm going to have excess demand. Okay. So my handwriting is horrendous with this board, but hopefully you can tell. Yeah. Right. So how would I go about answering this? Bef the diagram is very useful because there's a lot you can say. And remember, by the way, when you see your exam on Monday, um, there will be, uh, I'll talk about this at the end as well, it's like a little sort of pep talk for you guys, but there will be most likely at least one question that you will sit there and go, okay, I don't really know how to like approach this. Well, what, what is this? But you just need to just calm down for a second. If you can figure out what topic it is and you can construct the diagram for that topic, you are probably earning a lot of marks as long as you obviously explain the diagram and try to just answer it in relation to the question. So I'll go into more depth about this right at the end before I end the, end the live stream. But so the fact that I've drawn this diagram is really useful because I immediately can start making points about it. Well, the effect of imposing a maximum wage on the highest earners in an organization is that there is now less supply of high skilled labor. Why there's a contraction along the supply curve from QE in my diagram to Q1. Can you see the contraction? I've kind of done it with arrows, right? Because there's less incentive for individuals to work at this lower wage. They may actually leave the economy. You might get a brain drain where high skilled laborers start leaving, going to another economy where this isn't the case, where there isn't a maximum wage. Similarly, on the other end, though, the demand for labor will increase. There's an extension along the demand curve because firms think, hey, wow, these amazingly talented workers, these high skilled workers are really cheap now. So therefore, let's hire more of them. That creates excess demand, but in, in essence, it's problematic because excess demand is indicative of there being a skills shortage. It means firms want to hire loads of workers, but not enough people are applying at this given wage. So that's one of the problems that arises. As a part of the development as well, what I could throw in is that firms may become less productively efficient. The reason why is because they are worse placed to tap into managerial economies of scale. They're no longer able to get these really talented individuals that will reduce their costs and make them more productively efficient. That's another problem for the firm, yeah? So that's, that's uh, some of the things that I could start off with. Um, evaluation, the evaluation could be like the good things. And one of the evaluations here is that from the firm's perspective, you could argue that the costs are gonna go down because labor is an example of a variable cost. So you can draw MC and AC shifting down. I drew it, I think earlier when I did monopsony diagram. Yeah, I did in this, in this session. So same diagram, profits therefore will go up, uh, output will go up, prices will go down benefits the consumer as well because of the fact that they're getting lower prices. So that's, that's a good thing, yeah, could like one of the points. Other side of the debate in terms of why it could be really bad is again in terms of the problems that might arise. Well, it may create geographical immobility of labor because workers from outside of the UK now have much less incentives to come to the UK. So even if there are skills shortages and there are vacancies available, they're just not enticed to come because of the fact that it's just not uh, attractive. The other thing that might happen, which I think is a really clever point, is if they talk about, so if it is actually the reference to extra, uh, the extract references like Jeremy Corbyn's proposed, and it talks about how the highest earner in the organization can only earn 20 times more than the lowest earner, a really big problem that might arise is that for certain industries, like for example, supermarkets, what they might do is that they might start laying off the low skilled and low paid staff and changing them for machinery. So if I start laying off all of the cashiers and instead getting self-checkout machines all across the store, the lowest paid worker in my organization might get paid a fairly decent salary and therefore 20 times that is still huge, right? Therefore, that's a bad thing about this is that it actually may lead to unemployment. It's trying to protect the low-income workers and ensure that, you know, they are kind of, they're not disparagingly being paid or the gap isn't huge between them. But in doing so, it could be really problematic, yeah? And the and, and, and general evaluation, by the way, is that the impact will depend, depend, depend on the industry. So certain industries, you probably don't even see that in the first place. You don't see a 20 time uh, pay gap between the, those at the top and those at the bottom. Whereas other industries, yeah, you probably do, yeah? Now, another good thing that you could talk about, well, actually, maybe it will incentivize the firm to pay the low-skilled workers more. 
It might incentivize them to, for example, pay them the national living wage rather than just the national minimum wage, because in doing so, that means that 20 times that wage is a higher number. So that allows them to pay, for example, CEOs and shareholders a higher price, a higher wage, sorry. Clear? So that's the first essay or first topic that I think is fairly topical that could be a question. I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, the other one is renationalization of the railway. So basically privatization versus uh, nationalization. Right. The way I'd go about answering this, if I got a question about the arguments in favor and against renationalizing the railway, this is how I would go about it. I would start my first point off by talking about how the construct of the railway market in the UK resembles a natural monopoly. Because if you think about what a natural monopoly is, a natural monopoly is where the fixed and sunk costs are so, so high that it does not make sense for numerous firms to provide the good. It doesn't make sense for there to be multiple providers of this particular good. It only makes sense for one firm to provide all of the market output. So I can illustrate that through the AC curve, which looks like this for a natural monopoly. Uh, some mark schemes refer to it as like the L-shaped AC curve. I mean, I don't really want to refer to it like that, but this is AC. It looks something like that, right? So it's not your typical average cost curve. Now, the reason why, and the reason I can justify if it's a bigger question why it is a natural monopoly is because Think about the costs involved in the tracks uh, and like running and maintenance of the tracks and the, the whole system itself. You've got tracks that extend from south of the UK all the way to like really north in Scotland. So like, I don't know, Aberdeen and Glasgow and, and places like that, right? Whereby the cost involved in building in the first place and then maintaining the tracks is like mad. It's so, so high. Therefore, you need to produce so much output for your average cost to be anywhere near respectable, like low, right? Otherwise, if you produce only a segment of the market, so that's what I would illustrate here. So if there were numerous firms providing this particular service, they provide train services, then what you would end up with is a situation such as Q1, whereby each firm can only provide a very small segment of the market, like Q1, and therefore the cost per firm would be astronomical at C1. And the issue with that is that in order for the firm to survive, they would need to charge at least equal to C1. So the price would be extortionate. And that would be really bad for the consumer as well. Now, on the other hand, if one firm provides all of the market output, so let's say the market output is all the way at the end, so I'm going to call it Q2. Look at what their cost is now. It's much, much, much lower at C2. Because they can spread their costs over a massive amount of output, tap into the economies of scale that are existing in that industry. And so as a result, they... Um, that they, they can reduce their prices as well. So my first analysis would basically be focusing on the fact that it's uh, a natural monopoly. I would go, given that the railway industry seems um, that uh, it, it is a natural monopoly, uh, it is likely that it makes more sense for it to be nationalized and be in the hands of the government so that they can exploit all the economies of scale that exist, ensure that they are operating as low as possible on the AC curve, tap into the economies of scale, Consumers are going to be better off because of the fact that prices are also lower, and therefore it's, it's just a good idea. Yes, yeah, so that's on the side of it being a good idea. The bad idea, the evaluation kind of side of the essay is the private sector typically is more efficient than the public sector for a number of reasons. One is that private sector firms typically are accountable to shareholders, and so the profits that the firm make will determine how much they can pay shareholders. And in order for a firm to make profits, they need to be efficient, or they need to try and be as efficient as they can be. So they would want to tap into economies of scale. They would want to ensure that the shareholders are getting you know, at least a decent amount of profit. So you could argue the public sector is less efficient than the private sector, and therefore the actual operation may be quite unsuccessful. The scheme, as in the, the rails might be you know, delayed, they might not be very good, the quality might decline, etc., etc. Yeah. Second analysis, second thing in terms of why it's a good idea, why nationalizing the railway does make sense. Um, it's because if you think about it, the government's priority would not be to maximize profits. A private company, their priority would be Hey, I want to maximize my profits. From a government perspective, so if it was owned by the state, their priority would be to maximize welfare. Maximizing welfare is where you operate at the allocatively efficient level of output. In other words, where MC is equal to AR, right? MC is equal to price, same thing, MC equals to AR, yeah? Now, I would actually show this on a diagram. I would illustrate the difference in prices being charged if firms are maximizing profit compared to a situation where a firm were allocatively efficient. So I'm going to very quickly depict that on my board here. Let me just quickly whiz through it. So AR, SD, MR, so Q1. Okay. 
Now, I'm not so concerned about my cost in this particular question. That's not what the focus is. It's just looking at, I'm going to draw an AC curve. You'll see in a second. But my focus is just on output and price, comparison between how much units they'll produce of the good and at what price they would sell the good for. Right. If you look at the diagram, at Q1, that's where a firm is maximizing profits, whereas MC, marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. And the price that corroborates with that is P1. Whereas if a firm is operating at the allocatively efficient level of output, then they are operating at Q2. I don't know if you can see that very clearly. Basically, where MC equals AR, and the price is lower. So that's great for the consumer because it means the allocative efficiency has gone up. It means that consumer's surplus is going up. That's great. Now, I can develop that even more. Any profits that are made by the government, they're not going to be paid out to shareholders. They are probably going to be reinvested back into the railway. So, for example, they could invest into like making, I don't know, the seats comfier or uh, making sure they are on time, like better technology. They can create an app so you can see what time the train is going to arrive and whatever, right? And they can do like air conditioning for it. Anything like that. Just do real world application like that. Like make sure you apply it. Yeah. So that's really beneficial for the consumer as well. Now, those of you that are on, on AQA, there's a particular term in the old spec that they loved in the Marx unit. It's still there. And it's a really useful concept. Those of you that are at Excel, you can actually track this in as well, but it, like, it's not really as important and it probably wouldn't be on your mark scheme. But it's called the commanding heights argument. Commanding heights argument is just a fancy way of saying that certain industries are too vital to the economy to be left in the hands of the private sector. For example, the energy market, there's an argument that it should be nationalized because it's so essential, especially like for the elderly, especially like in winter months, that if you have private companies in charge of the energy sector, they might charge extortionately high prices. They might collude with one another. And as a result, some people might not be able to get energy. Well, the railway system is very important because people need to use the rail, for example, to get to and from work, to get to and from school, whatever it might be, right? Therefore, one of the benefits arising from this is that this vital resource, if it's in the hands of the government, is more likely to be provided to individuals and at a price that's more affordable so that low-income households are not excluded from it, so that the elderly are not excluded, they can afford to go on the trains, etc. So that's another good thing, right? Bonus point here, another thing that I can definitely talk about, I think is a really strong analysis for this, is it increases the geographical mobility of labor. Because um, if you have a really strong functioning rail system, it is easier for people to go from one area to another, to take up a job, they can travel, they don't need to necessarily live in that area, they can just travel back and forth to work. And that's the analysis, right? The evaluation, the last thing that I could do as an evaluation is, but the problem is, is that when it's in the hands, purely in the government's hands and the lack of competition, there might be X inefficiency. The firm might start to incur unnecessarily high costs. They may mismanage it to the point where actually it's loss making. And in that scenario, the taxpayer needs to basically pay for it. And that's not good. It might even mean that they have to start charging high prices to consumers. And as a result, the consumer is worse off rather than being better off. That's it. Nationalization in a nutshell. Okay, privatization is just the opposite. So privatization is arguments in favor will be that more competition leads to lower prices, higher choice, maybe higher quality. Eval is it might construct a natural, it might be a natural monopoly, so competition is not a good idea, it's really bad. Um, another analysis for privatization could be that by privatizing, it means that firms have an incentive to consistently innovate and to maintain their market share, so dynamic efficiency tends to be high. On the other hand, they have a lot of monopoly power potentially because the market structure might be such that it's typically difficult to enter, the barriers to entry might be high, but it's hard to reach the MES, so you just exploit consumers. All right, right uh, I'm going to keep going for another. Uh, 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, Let's see how we feel, pretty tired. Uh, I'll try and get through as many questions as I can. So there's a few more on my phone that I just want to quickly go through. Um, so hopefully I've answered as many of your questions as you can. Ah, okay, right. Very quick diagram. Guaranteed minimum price scheme. So let's just make sure that we know how to draw that. Guaranteed minimum price scheme. So there's different types of minimum price schemes. One that's non-guaranteed and there's one that's guaranteed. Non-guaranteed will mainly be put on demerit goods. So in Scotland, they have a minimum price scheme on alcohol as a means of trying to disincentivize individuals from buying alcohol because now the price can't fall below that level. And so the level is meant to be quite a high price so that it's hard for people to get their hands onto alcohol. Guaranteed minimum price schemes, the purpose mainly is to protect farmers or producers in order to ensure that they are getting a certain level of income, in order to combat volatility of prices and things like that. So. If I had to draw the diagram, it's really straightforward. You have price and quantity on the axes, supply and demand. So just draw me supply and demand start off with, please, and label that initial equilibrium, QE, QE. 
then the minimum price must be set above the equilibrium. It does not make sense for it to be below the equilibrium. It has no effect on the market at all if it's below equilibrium. So this is min price, and this is P1, Q1, Q2. Now, what you're gonna get is excess supply for the good. Make sure you label it. So excess supply. Right, so this is my diagram up to now. I've got my minimum price, I've got my excess supply, and I've got my um, uh, supply and demand, yeah? Now, in a guaranteed minimum price scheme, the government says, I will buy up every single unit that is left over off you at the minimum price. So now, in order for me to calculate the area, to shade it in, that represents how much the government is spending on this, on, on this scheme, I need to know two things. I need to know what the excess supply is, and I know that, it's this distance here, it's from Q1 to Q2 on my diagram, and I need to multiply that by the minimum price. Well, do I know the minimum price? Yeah, it's P1. Do you see this whole thing over here, this whole massive like rectangle? Shed that whole thing in and that you label government spending. The government will spend all of that money on the minimum price scheme. Cool. How, why would they do this? Well, there's a couple of things that you could do as analysis for this in terms of why it will protect farmers. If prices are really volatile, whereby they go up and down all the time, it's very difficult for a producer to plan ahead. By having a guaranteed minimum price scheme like this, though, it's much easier to plan ahead because you know that legally the price cannot fall below minimum. So you know that that's the worst case scenario, can't go below that. The government is also pledging to buy up the excess off you, so therefore your profits are going to go up. You can invest the profits into R&D, dynamic efficiency, the whole shebang again. You can employ more workers, it's really good for you in that sense. A really clever point, I think, to talk, talk about here in a micro essay as well is that a guaranteed minimum price scheme, even a minimum price scheme actually, but guaranteed in particular, decreases monopsony power. The reason why is because if Tesco now turn around to you and go, oh, we want a lower price, you're like, well, sorry, it's illegal. I can't sell it to you below this price because the government says that this is the legal minimum, so haha. So therefore, monopsony power is decreased. That's a, such a clever point to throw in as well. Evals, it can create a dependency culture. The firms, and um, particularly farmers, can become overly reliant on the subsidy, oh, sorry, the, on the minimum price scheme because they know the government's gonna buy the excess off them, so therefore they don't really bother with reducing their costs or increasing efficiency. One, and that leads to potentially X inefficiency. Two, is that the effectiveness or the impact, I guess, on the market depends on the elasticity of demand. Maybe the consumer's willing to pay the majority of it so they don't reduce their consumption that much of the good. Another thing that you could talk about is that it depends where the government sets the minimum price. Scheme. If it's set below equilibrium, you're gonna get excess demand, which will signal to the producer that the price is too low, therefore raise your price, it's the minimum price, I can raise my price, I can't reduce my price, so I'll raise my price back up to equilibrium. In other words, what was the point in that? There was no point. There was literally no point in doing that. So in other words, if the government sets it below the equilibrium, especially because it's volatile, it's difficult for them to know where equilibrium really is, then in essence what will happen is, is that the market just goes back to equilibrium. It does nothing. It's just not effective whatsoever. Cool? Right, let's have a look at some of the other questions. Um, Right, let's see if there's other questions here that I want to quickly try and go through. Regulation and banking, macro, and only AQA. Those of you that are at Excel, there is a document on the Excel website, it's called Getting Started, it's detailed specification. It will literally list everything you actually need to know. And when it comes to the financial sector, I know a lot of schools have been teaching this, I guess it's like good real world knowledge and it's interesting for you guys to know, but it explicitly says that students are not required to know different types of regulation, they're not required to know things like, I don't know, the CFA and whatever in terms of the financial sector. So don't worry about that. If you're AQA, unlucky, lucky, yeah, you kind of need to know about that. But again, it's not too difficult. Right, what else have we got? Um, uh, can you evaluate an indirect tax with an inequality to micro -pep? Yes, you can. Uh, and you can develop that point. If you say that, for example, an indirect tax is an example of a regressive tax, in the sense that it will affect low-income households more than high-income households. This, therefore, is an example of government failure. Yes, it's definitely going to be on the mark scheme. That's fine. Um, is regulation a fixed cost? It depends on the regulation. Um, it depends what's happened. So, for example, if they, um, as a one-off cost, get you to now upgrade to buy... Uh, so June 2013 had a question about egg farming and how they had to upgrade their hen, like their cages for hens, like they had to be bigger. 
uh, that would, I guess, be a fixed cost. Mark seems usually fairly flexible in terms of fixed and variable costs when it's not so obvious. So I wouldn't worry too much, but you can figure out. The way to figure out is a fixed cost is one that doesn't change with output. A variable cost is one that does change with output. So the question I would always ask myself is, do I need more of this thing to produce more output? So for example, when they increased or they were talking about introducing the national living wage, June 2017, uh, uh, paper three, 12 marker, talked about from a cost and revenue perspective in terms of profitability, what happens if they introduce a national living wage? Well, labor is a variable cost. The reason why it's variable is because you ask the question, do I need more workers to produce more output? Yeah, therefore it's a variable cost. Every single unit of labor now becomes more expensive. So some people approach that from the perspective of it being a fixed cost. And the Marx scheme was fairly lenient, but in reality, you should have done it from the perspective of uh, um, variable cost. Cool? Right. Um, what do you have a zero hour contract? Workers be very cost. No, uh, zero hour contracts uh, are not the only examples of variable cost. Any labor is variable cost because I get to decide how many units of labor are hired. So, for example, if wages go up, I can start firing workers, right? And the next unit of labor that I have to hire, if there's a minimum wage or a national living wage, I have to pay them that higher wage. Therefore, that additional unit, the variable cost, is higher. So, no, not just zero hour contracts. Um, evaluate the factors that determine wages in competitive, non-competitive labor markets. Okay, again, those of you that are at Excel, different to those of you that are at AQA. AQA, um, do you know what, I was meant to do this last time, I will definitely do this at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll let you guys know that I'll add Excel when it's done for you guys. Uh, for AQA, I want to go through like a more complicated diagram, which is uh, monopsony power in the labor market uh, and, and how to answer questions like that for you, for you guys, because it's a bit more detailed. Uh, not necessarily maybe for paper one, although actually in paper one as well, but mainly paper three, the, the, the multiple choice. Um, in terms of Excel, seriously, it's literally supply and demand, like it's the easiest thing in the whole world. It's like the things that will determine whether wages are high or low. So when they mean competitive market, they mean like supply and demand. Non-competitive market is where the government has intervened, so they've imposed something like a national minimum wage or a national living wage. That's it. The factors that will affect wages in a market will be like the elasticity of demand and supply for labor. So if I look at an example like football players and I compare it to, let's say, a, a cashier, right? Well, a football player, they are much more scarce in the sense that I'm talking about like Premier League football players, like really, really high level. So therefore, the supply of labor is very, very inelastic. It takes a number of years for you to become a football player. Not everyone can become a football player. It's very difficult. Similarly, in neurosurgeons, it takes years and years for someone to become a brain surgeon. So therefore, it's going to be very, very inelastic in supply and in demand. So, for example, think about it in terms of football. If Lionel Messi turns around to Barcelona and goes, I want a higher salary, they really can't turn around and be like, mm, yeah, no, we don't want to pay you that salary because he's so essential to the football club. Therefore, the demand is extremely inelastic as well. Neurosurgeon, again, if neurosurgeons try to get a higher wage, they probably would be able to. There would only be a small reduction in the number of units that the firm will reduce how much they demand neurosurgeons, like a hospital, because they're essential to the hospital. Therefore, the demand and supply being inelastic means the wages obviously are going to be really, really, really inelastic, uh, sorry, really, really high. In comparison to low-skilled labor where it's very elastic and therefore wages are going to be low. Cool? Right. Um, uh, AQA, I will go through monopsony diagram with you guys. I, if I forget, someone quickly message on Facebook because I've written it down, but I'll, I'll do that. Um, third degree price simulation diagram, please. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, third degree price discrimination diagram. There are two versions of doing this diagram. Um, there's the one in the uh, more detailed specifications, slightly more complicated version. And then there's a really easy version. So can I start off with a really easy version first for price discrimination diagram? And then we'll do the slightly harder version of price discrimination. Um, so the really, really easy version is just this. You're going to have three diagrams side by side. Okay. So this is extremely difficult to do on a very, very small whiteboard, but I will do my best. And the idea is, is that you have sub-markets. So the idea behind price discrimination is where you're charging different prices to different consumers for the exact same good. So let's say that I was doing peak versus off-peak tickets on the trains. So I'd have train company as my third one. That's the firm. And then I've got peak and off-peak. Right. The really, really, really easy version, the one that like takes two seconds to do, is what I will do is after I draw these three diagrams, is the assumption is, is that marginal cost is constant between the submarkets. The marginal cost is the same whether an adult, so an adult, if someone is on the train during peak hours or during off-peak hours, doesn't really change anything in terms of the cost of the train company providing that seat. Therefore, I'm going to draw a perfectly elastic MC curve 
but I'm going to take it through all three sub-markets. So I'm going to pick a point like this. And I'm going to say MC is equal to AC, just for the sake of making it easy to see profits as well. Okay, so it doesn't look amazing, but that's that will do. So MC is equal to AC across the three sub-markets. Right, easy peasy. In the first market, during the peak hours, you expect demand to be elastic or inelastic. Well, it'll be very inelastic. So you draw a demand curve, AR and MR, where it's very, very inelastic. Sort of like this. I mean, it's not amazing, but it will do. MR. So like that. And you go to the profit maximizing level of output. I probably need to make my thing a little bit steeper. Yeah. Which is where MC equals MR. So that's Q1. I get my price by dotting up to the demand curve, AR. P1 and the supernormal profits the firm makes is the difference between the price P1 and the cost, which is basically where the MC line is. Yeah? Well, the elastic market off peak is elastic, so therefore I now start at a lower point on your y axis and make it really, really elastic. This is my second price, this is my second quantity, and my supernormal profits are there. Okay, so can you see that? So I've got Q2 and P2, yeah? Now, the third market, easiest thing in the world, all I can do is a combination of the two, like, oh, well, not a combination, like, it's an average between the two. I'm just gonna go halfway. So I'm gonna go halfway between the two and draw, it doesn't matter what elasticity is. And this is the situation where the firm is not price discriminating. In the third diagram, you're illustrating where, before price discrimination, this is how much profit they would have made. It's like the old profit they make. I would just write SMP. I'm just showing it for you guys for the sake of understanding it. This is the diagram. Okay, that's it. That's the easy version of the diagram. Slightly harder version of the diagram if you wanted to show off a little bit and you wanted to and you had time. Bear in mind, time is an issue in this paper. Is we can do it in the following way. We're going to have to go backwards for this one to make more sense of it. So let's do it from the perspective of cinema now. So I'm going to do three side by side again. Okay, and I'm going to do uh, view cinema as my example. So this is view, and we're going to have adults and students. Obviously, you label your axes. I'm being a bit lazy just because why not? Right, now, this time we're going to start here and work backwards. And the way we're going to construct the diagram is as follows. We're going to draw a normal MC curve, just a standard MC curve, like this. Okay, so just a standard MC curve as, as follows. Now, the demand curve is going to have a unique shape. The re reason why is this. So I'm going to start really high up on the y-axis, like right at the top, okay? And initially, we'll assume that when the price is really high, the only people that can afford to go to the cinema will be adults, where the demand is very inelastic. Students are completely priced out of the market initially, so the demand initially starts off being very, very, very inelastic, okay? So I'm going to draw a very inelastic line like that. But then, at a certain point, so you just make it up, it doesn't matter where, Eventually, the price is low enough that consumers can now enter the market. And now, when consumers enter the market, the demand amongst the students, not consumers, the students enter the market. When they enter the market, the demand amongst them is more elastic. So I'm going to now kink it outwards to show the fact that students have entered the market. This is the demand curve. Okay? It looks something like that because I've got the adult market initially, and then eventually the student market comes into the market. And MR is half the slope of that, so I'm going to kind of just... Do something like this. Cool? So far so good with me? Right now, profit maximization, as always we know, is where MC is equal to MR, so I'm going to dot down and label that QE. That's the output the firm would produce at. I get my price by dotting up until I hit the average revenue curve, demand, and that's my price, PE. Now, this is the important bit. I'm going to now show them making super normal profits, probably not that much super normal profit, but I'm going to do it somewhere over here. And what I do is after I draw the AC curve, I will dot up until I hit the AC curve and I dot across and I call that C1. Or CE, I guess, sorry, CE. And the super normal profits the firm will be making is this. Yeah? Everyone with me so far? Now, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. And the rationale is still the same. That in the sub-markets, the marginal cost is the same whether it's an adult in the cinema or a student in the cinema, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. The way that I can figure out the marginal cost between the sub-markets here is I dot up from QE, my quantity that I'm producing as a firm, until I hit the MC curve. So for mine, 
When I dot up, I hit the MC curve right there. I'm going to dot across on that point, and now I'm going to now draw it as a solid line. Okay, that is MC. AC is where I hit the dotted line, hits AC, which we know is CE. So I'm now, so you see where CE is, that cost, where QE equals hits average cost. I can now draw average cost above that point there. That's my average cost. Cool. I now have AC, I have MC, and I derived that from the third diagram by going up from the quantity. Until I hit MC, that was the point at which marginal cost is derived right from. If I go up from quantity until I hit where the average cost curve gets hit, that's my average cost in the submarkets. Okay, now it's really easy. Students are elastic in demand, so I'm going to start at the point where I kinked my demand curve. So I kinked it over there. I'm going to start same point over here. Just make it really elastic, so something like this. Just exaggerate it a little bit. So AR and then MR. Profit maximization occurs where MC is equal to MR. So that's the quantity over here, Q2. The price, I go up until I hit the AR curve, P2. And my profit is the difference between that and average cost. So the profit my firm in the student market is making is that. I now do the same thing, but now for the adults, it's inelastic. So I start at a really high point on the adult market. So I'm going to just make mine really inelastic. MR, AR. And again, profit maximization occurs where MC is equal to MR. So that's quantity Q1. And the price is P1. Supernormal profits, again, it's that strip there. Okay? And that's the diagram done. Is that fine? All right, cool. So uh, I think we are going to call it a day uh, for now. Can you use max, sorry, it's really good. Can you use max minimum prices to correct externalities? Uh, you can, but I wouldn't. Basically, they will they'll be looking for you to do it from the perspective of tax and subsidies. So why, why do anything else? Okay? Um, right. So those of you that are um, at Excel, just a couple of things in terms of advice, in terms of how you go about revising from here on in, uh, and also how to deal with exam pressure and exam nerves and what happens in an exam. Um, so first and foremost, I, I genuinely think that if you have gone through all of the topics and understand the theory that underpins each topic, like for example with behavioral economics, you know that computational problems can lead to irrational behavior, a habitual behavior could lead uh, to irrational behavior, things like that, right? Then actually, irrespective of what comes up, you are in a position to answer it. Even if it's worded in a way that can seem a bit kind of daunting, um, my approach would be this, is that I want you guys to make sure that you're going at one minute a mark for those of you that don't get extra time. So you have 100, 100 marks, 120 minutes. If you complete section A in 25 minutes, section A, by the way, where you've got multiple choice questions, so this is specific to you guys at Excel for now, um, but the way you've got multiple choice questions, if you are not sure, you can just guess and come back if you've got time, but you should write something. Like if it's a three marker, a two marker, define something. Just just try to like find an answer in there, right? But don't just leave it completely blank. It doesn't make sense to do that. And even if, like, especially multiple choice, even if you have no idea, just guess between them. You might be lucky. It's a one in four chance. You might get it right. But don't spend more than 25 minutes on it. Don't spend ages and ages and ages trying to figure out a question. If you don't know it straight away and it doesn't just register, just move on. Come back to it later if you still got 25 minutes in that 25 minutes. Just guess for now and then come back. So that's the first thing is a minute and mark. Then when you get to section B and the data response, I would immediately flick over to the page that has the questions on it. And I would read the, the 15 marker and I would read the 12 marker, possibly the 10, but mainly the 15 and 12. And in my mind, I should already be planning it. I should know what topic it is and what the main points are before I've even read the data. I would take two different colors highlighters into the exam with you. I'd have one for the 15 marker and one for the 12 marker. And whenever you find data that will help to develop any of the points that you thought of for the 15 marker, you highlight it in that color. Anytime you find data that's relevant for the 12, you highlight it in that color, yeah? So that would basically be um, the, the thing that I would do. Therefore you straight away, will, you'll be saving a lot of time rather than having to constantly glance back, finding data references to support your point, you know it. Now, planning. You should be planning the 15 marker for sure, and you should be planning the 25 marker without a doubt. You spend about three, four, five minutes to plan. Take your time planning it so that you know what your chains of reasoning are, 
what the key terms are, and how to flesh the point out thoroughly enough that it's worthy of the marks. Um, in terms of the layout for your exam and what you need to do, I sent a document around recently uh, where I, I want to actually amend it. I'm going to post it on our Facebook page later, but very quickly, this is my advice in terms of how you navigate your way through the Edexcel Paper 1 and Paper 2 exam. Any questions in section A, there are three marks or above, so normally only three marks or four, four marks. At least one of the marks is application even if it doesn't say with reference to. So it will re you have to reference if they've given you some data. They will usually give you like an extract, like a little paragraph or a figure or a chart or whatever. You have to reference it. If you do not reference it, you cannot get full marks. That's the first thing. Second is five markers in section B. A lot of people are getting four out of five. When I look at past papers or papers that students are sending over to me that they've sat, a lot of the time they're answering it perfectly but only getting four out of five. And the reason why is that they're not getting the second application mark. There are two application marks. Make sure you apply twice explicitly and clearly in a five marker. Answer the question, but apply really blatantly. The only time where you can't really do anything but apply if you're very lucky and you get a percentage change as like a five marker, like honestly dream, they had that in the uh, paper two for June 2017. Just use the numbers, like to show you working out and you get five marks, There's, that's it, yeah? Eight marker, eight marker, you do two analysis, please. Two analysis, but they're very, very basic analysis, nothing too in depth. There is one knowledge mark, one application mark, and one analysis mark. So in other words, you do your topic sentence, you apply it from the data and you explain it. Whether that's one sentence, two sentences, as long as it's explained enough that someone will understand it, it's enough. So you do that twice, and then one evaluation that's just like a passing comment, like an easy evaluation could be, oh, however, it depends on the magnitude of this, and then I quote from the data and I go, oh, that's not very big, or, you know, oh, that's mad, that's really big, yeah? Um, an example would be last year. So last year, the eight marker was about the elasticity of uh, electricity bills or electricity or energy in general uh, in the short run compared to the long run. So the analysis was in the short run, in elastic is minus 0 0.25 or minus 0 0.35, um, and why? Well, people might be tied into contracts, it might be that they're exhibiting habitual behavior, inertia, they can't be bothered to switch. In the long run, it became more elastic because it was minus 0 0.85. And the reasons for that is that contracts may have ended. It could be that, um, you know, people suddenly started to switch because they got more information, they understand, they're getting ripped off, blah, 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 blah. Eval. Valuation could be something like this. However, given that the elasticity has only changed from minus 0 0.35 to minus 0 0.85, it has remained elastic even into the long run. And so, it's still not significant. People are still exhibiting high levels of habitual behavior and inertia. So, eight marks, yeah? Ten marker, ten marker, two analysis, a bit more depth than an eight marker, not too much more, but enough more depth than an eight marker, and one well-developed evaluation will suffice. If you don't have a well-developed evaluation, though, do two, to be safe. But you may not have enough time in an exam to do two evaluations. One well-developed one should actually be enough. Twelve marker, two analysis again, but now a bit more depth again. And I would probably do two evaluations if I had time. Again, if I'm running out of time, one well-developed evaluation will suffice. It will get you potentially four out of four. You can get four marks per evaluation if it's strong. Yes, there's only four marks available for that. 15 marker. 15 marker, the way you're going to go about it is two really well-developed analyses and two really well-developed evaluations. If there are definitions, by the way, in a 15, 12, 10, throw them in. Pretend they're not marked. They are a mark, but pretend it's not. Like, for example, if the question is about price discrimination, straight away define it. If the question is about contestability, straight away you go, a contestable market is one in which there are low barriers to entry and exit and low sunk costs, yeah? Um, so that's the 15 marker, no judgment, 15 marker, 25 marker, intro if possible, if you've got time, defining key terms, really, really developed analysis, really developed evaluation, second half of the essay, really developed analysis, really well developed evaluation, and then you have to, have to, have to do a judgment. You have to do a judgment. Those of you that are AQA in particular, but at Excel as well, you have to do a judgment in the 25 marker in order for you to be in the category of getting the highest marks, yeah? Right, so that's uh, us for those of you that are at Excel. I'll post all of that up on, a, on Facebook, uh, so please check back over here. If you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, sorry, I know we had a bit of an issue with our YouTube channel, but please do so if you haven't liked our YouTube pa uh, Facebook page. Please do so, hopefully you guys found that really helpful. Um, Feel free to message questions on the Facebook group as well, on, on um, private message. I'll try my best to respond to as many questions as I possibly can. And yeah, I, I really wish you guys the very best of luck. You guys, you'll smash it, you'll do very, very well. Uh, those of you that are AQA, stay behind, basically. Just wanna go through one diagram with you guys and then uh, I will go home. So, AQA, uh, the last diagram.
that I want to do with you guys is um, the effect of monopsony uh, in the labor market, what the labor market looks like for monop when there's a monopsony in place, and the effect of a trade union, why actually trade union is really good for a market where there is a monopsonist in the labor market. So the NHS is a good example. The NHS is a monopsonist. They hire nurses and doctors, and they have bargaining power over them. So the way that the diagram is constructed is as follows. You've got quantity of labor on the x-axis and wage rates on, or wages, doesn't matter, on the y-axis, like that. Now, one of the most common errors that students make is to label marginal cost of labor and average cost of labor. You know they're upper sloping, but to get them mixed up, to not know which one is which. The way to think about it is through a very basic mathematical example. So imagine that I hire someone and initially I paid them 10 pounds. So that means the marginal cost, because I hired that person, was 10 pounds. And the average cost, because I got 10, 10 pounds but only one worker, is also 10 pounds. If I then hire a second worker, the way that I incentivize someone to work for me, I need to offer a higher wage. So in order to do that, let's say I offer them 11 pounds. So the next unit of labor, suddenly now it's 11 pounds. The marginal cost is 11 pounds. The average cost, though, is 10 plus 11, 21, divided by 2. In other words, it's 10.5. So average cost of labor doesn't increase as quickly as the marginal cost of labor. So MC will be higher. Marginal cost of labor will be like this. And the average cost of labor, which is also the supply of labor, will be like this. We've got this so far, yeah? We've got marginal cost of labor and average cost of labor, also known as the supply of labor. Then you've got the demand curve, which you, in your board, always refer to as the marginal revenue product, MRP which is equal to demand. Cool. Now, a firm in a monopsony, in any firm, uh, basically wants to maximize profits in the same way in the labor market as it does in the goods market. So in other words, the number of units that they will employ, or the number of workers they will employ, is where marginal cost of labor, MC, is equal to marginal revenue product, in other words, MR. So I dot down from where MCL equals MRP, and I get that as my quantity. That's the number of units I hire. That's the number of workers I'm going to employ. Yeah. Now, because I am a monopsonist, I'm the NHS, I could afford to pay you the equivalent of the marginal cost. So if it were a competitive market, I might need to pay you that wage because of the fact that you, know, you can go work somewhere else. But you don't really have much choice. Therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the wage that you say is the wage you'd be willing to work for at that salary, at that quantity. So how do I determine that? I go up from the quantity until I hit the average cost of labor, the supply of labor, basically. So I dot across, and that's W1. Cool? Now, this is where it gets interesting, but I'm going to need loads of different colors for you guys. Honestly, how do you draw this in your exam? You have to do like A, B, C, and like letters and stuff. But for the sake of trying to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to depict it on my diagram with different colors. So, starting point is this. If trade unions now get involved in this market, forcing the wage up, for example, making it a legal obligation for a firm to pay a minimum wage above W1 that we have at the moment. So I'm going to pick another wage, just a little bit higher than W1. So I'm going to pick W2, you know, just force this wage. And imagine now they've been successful so that the wage they have to pay the employees is equal to this new wage, W2. That will affect the shape of the average cost of labor because it is illegal for you to supply your services below that wage. It is illegal for a firm to be paying you below W2 now. Therefore, the supply of labor will just consistently go, it'll be elastic, up until the point where it connects again with the original supply of labor. Why? Because then the supply of labor maps out at different wages, what people are willing to work, how many units of labor are willing to work. Well, if I draw a perfectly elastic supply, so if I, let me try and do this so you guys can actually see at the same time. If I go from there, straight line, so I hit the average cost of labor. Now, beyond that point, to employ an extra worker beyond this, now you're going to need to offer a higher wage because the people that are willing to work at W2, they've been exhausted, they've been exhausted now, they've been, they're employed. So now the supply of labor just goes back to being an upward sloping light. So it becomes the same thing as it was before, the average cost of labor. But the shape of the ACL, the average cost of labor, is now that green line. Okay, so it's perfectly elastic until it connects with the average cost of labor, and then it just goes back to being the old average cost of labor. Now, the marginal cost of labor is interesting because the marginal cost of labor is determined very much by the average cost of labor as well. It's very, very linked. So I'm going to do this in red so that it's easier to see. The point at which it's perfectly elastic, 
whereby every single worker that you're hiring, you're having to pay them W2, that point where it's elastic, right? Marginal cost of labor is constantly going to just be W2 as well because the cost of employing one more worker is going to be that wage because I have to pay that wage. So now, my marginal cost of labor, I start at W2, and it goes over the green line to that point, till it hits the kink. Now, when it hits the kink, something really interesting will happen. Those of you that do maths, I mean, even if you don't maths, it's really not important to understand why, you just need to know that it happens, is that whenever there's a kink, it's a turning point in math. In other words, the gradient is zero. Therefore, it's going to become perfectly inelastic at that point. It's going to go straight up, okay? Because the elasticity is zero, so it does that. Now, what will happen then is I go straight up from here, where I've got my MCL, until I hit the old MCL. When it hits the old MCL, it then reverts back to the old shape again, because it's just half a slope of the or it's double the slope, sorry, of the ACL. See the red line? It's a really weird shape. So it, it goes like there, then up, and then across again, like up that way. Yeah? Right. Nearly done. So how do we do it now? The same thing is true, that they operate at the point of output where MCL equals MRP, marginal revenue product, equals marginal uh, cost of labor. But now look at what happened. Marginal cost of labor equals the marginal revenue product. If I look at my red line and compare it to marginal revenue product, it hits it there. Can you see that? Yeah? Can everyone see that I got that? Therefore, if I dot down from that point, that is the number of units of labor they're gonna hire. They end up hiring more workers even though the wages that they are paying are higher. In other words, trade unions are very, very good if there is a monopsony in the labor market because it doesn't just cause wages to go up, it also causes quantity of units of labor to also go up as well. That is, I think, the most complicated diagram that you are expected to draw across the whole of the two-year spec for those of you that are AQA. Right, that's us. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for um, kind of putting your trust in me, I guess. And I hope you do very well in your exam. All the best. Good luck.